OTB's The Hurling Pod with Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship. Welcome along to episode nine of season two of The Hurling Pod. It is with Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship and the Legends Tour Series at Croke Park. We've got a league final to look forward to. That's a repeat of the All-Ireland final from last year. It's going to be in Porky Cueve. First time in over 40 years that Cork has hosted the final on Easter Sunday. It's a 2pm start for Limerick against Kilkenny. Kilkenny looking to win a record 20th title and the first since they were the joint champions in 2021 when we didn't have a final. Limerick are going for their 14th and it's a chance for them to go and win the league for the first time since they went back to back in 2019 and 2020. Glad to say, Paul Murphy, James Scale here with me. How are you getting on, lads? How's it going, boys? Very good. How are you, lads? Murph, let's kick it off with Porky Cueve as a venue because Liam Sheedy pretty quickly afterwards said, quote, appreciate there's a football game in Thurless on Sunday, but surely Semple Stadium on Saturday night would have been a better option for both counties. I sense the venue would also have attracted more neutrals and added to the atmosphere. As I mentioned at the outset there, it's been 42 years since Porky Cueve had a league final. Semple Stadium would seem the very obvious place to have it, but because of that football game on the Sunday, I'm sure there was probably some TV considerations around having it on Sunday afternoon as well. What do you think about Porky Cueve as a venue for Limerick and Kilkenny? Yeah, I was surprised to hear it. Um, it, it like you're not going to get as much a crowd as if you had it in Turles, or even if I think you just flipped a coin in Gaelic grounds or Nolan Park. Um, you know, it's the equivalent really of Cork and Limerick playing each other in Nolan Park. I mean, it's 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 the same difference in my book. It's not convenient, maybe for the Limerick crowd, for certain parts of Limerick it might be, but I just think Turles is. And more convenient for I know a lot of people say you're looking at it from Kilkenny tinted glasses, but I am looking for looking at it through Kilkenny tinted glasses. Um, but yeah, I think it's made for it. I know the football is on, but I certainly think you could make a bit of room there to slot the league final for the hurling into Turles, or at least as I was saying, as a second option. I don't think either county would would give out if you flipped a coin and played it in either of their own uh, county grounds. Scale, you were praising Porky Cueve a few weeks ago when you were down there with the Galway Miners. It's a fantastic venue. It's perhaps a little bit underused. Can you see the GA's logic in going to Porky Cueve for this one? I, I can, and I, I'd imagine um, even Cork themselves were trying to get, get showcased even more. Uh, it's a fabulous stadium. It's definitely, like, in terms of uh, a modern facility, it's, it's second there to Crow Park. It's, it's, it's brilliant. And, like, look, at Limerick won't say much too much about it. It's only an hour down the road for them, or a bit less, 100k, Kilkenny a bit further away. Um, but it's a fabulous what they've done with the pitch in recent uh, months you, you remember there was a bit of controversy there a p- couple of years ago when it first opened about the pitch that, that's just been eradicated now so the surface is fabulous big stadium lovely pitch you know in terms of the crowd I'd imagine there'll be car people attending also and good dro- droves of people travelling so I, I, I couldn't imagine they'll be getting 40,000 wherever they go but they certainly they should be getting 15 to 20 right for league final I think so Which, should yeah. Be, yeah. Sure, there was what twenty thousand in watching the first round. I know that was Cork, Cork against Limerick, yeah. and maybe there was the excitement of the start of the year. But you would hope that a combination of the two counties and neutrals going in, you'd clear twenty thousand scale, surely. Yeah, I think I think on current form as well. I have as much as I flipping hate to say it. It's it's teams one and two ranked in the country at the moment, so it's going to be the first, I suppose, showdown between them. Hopefully, the last as well. <laughs> Hopefully, the last because we know we know where Limerick are going. Um, but look, I think it's going to be a great game in a great stadium. So, look, I have no complaints. Mm. Just go to show, Murph. My power rankings were solid when we had them yeah. one and two and didn't change since the start of the year. Mm. Um, it is interesting, though, the psychology for Kilkenny. And you're a Kilkenny man who can give us a bit on the psychology because I was reading John Milan's column during the week and he was saying this is a great opportunity for Kilkenny to land a little bit of a psychological blow. So he was saying if Kilkenny were to go out here, show that maybe Limerick are vulnerable by getting a win in a meaningful fixture in a league final, it might actually open up hope, not just for Kilkenny later in the year, but maybe for those teams who are about to face them in Munster in a few weeks' time as well. Yeah, it's a fair point. Um, it would it would be a big psychological blow. I think particularly for Kilkenny, you know, it would give other teams maybe a small bit of hope coming into, particularly, like you said, the Munster teams. Um, but maybe to see that small bit of vulnerability in Limerick, I don't, to be honest myself, uh, I, I don't think it's going to happen in the league final just yet. Um, and that's not to be playing down Kilkenny or anything, but it's just, you know, some weeks we've been sitting here and we've been talking about a few areas that Kilkenny will want to improve in, you know, two of the games at least anyway, you know, their ball handling, they would certainly like to improve and they know that they're not the finished article yet to have a crack at Limerick. Um, But what I do think the real positive that will come from this is, 
you know, Kilkenny has tried a lot of players uh, during the league and a lot of players haven't played, well, a good few players, particularly the likes of Drennan, that haven't played against Limerick, you know, and it's a completely different beast to do it. So to expose, you know, any of the newer players to, you know, the, the runaway train that is Limerick, it'll be important for them. And also playing in a league final, a bit of pressure, a bit of practice as well for building up to a big game. There's lots of positives that Kilkenny can take from this. I don't even believe, though, to be honest, that if Kilkenny do go and beat Limerick here, in the league final that, you know, Limerick will have any doubt if they meet Kilkenny again. I still think Limerick just really believe in their abilities at the moment. Um, and I don't think that, you know, by the time Kilkenny would meet Limerick again, that Limerick would be really worried, even, Kil- even if Kilkenny go and beat them in the league final. So look, at the moment, it's, I just think it's a great opportunity for Kilkenny to go and test the team they have. Like you could probably pick the Limerick starting 15 at the moment, but it's quite hard to pick the Kilkenny 15. So a lot will probably decide who's going to be a starting 15 in Derek Ling's um, most important matches in Leinster. Um, you know, we will see, I think, a wide variety of players, but I think the likes of this match, you'll see a fairly close to what Derek Ling thinks is his starting 15. That with the terms and conditions of if Lazar carrying a few injuries, he's still not going to chance them. So it'll be interesting. And I do think it's going to be a great match because really there's not a huge amount of pressure on Kilkenny coming into this. I think Limerick will play a strong team. And if Limerick line out with a strong team, they'll expect to beat Kilkenny probably by six or seven points. That's what a lot of neutrals will expect. So Kilkenny can learn a lot from this and bring a lot into the round robin from it. Skell, you hear him talking Kilkenny down already. Anthony Nash, on his piece and off the ball last Friday, was saying this is going to be remarkably close. He thinks Kilkenny can challenge Limerick in the same way they did in the All-Ireland final. And you have Paul Murphy there saying, you know, six or seven points. You reckon he's trying to ease the pressure off them here? Well, for, I have a question for Murphy before I get him to my answer. Go on. Is, is TJ Cordy or Mullen going to play? In your opinion? I, I don't think TJ will play. No, I don't think there's any point in playing him now at this stage. Um, I probably Cody will surely play or? I'd say Cody will play I don't think Adrian will play either I mean if you look at Balahail didn't play Adrian in the All-Ireland final and you know he had he, I'll not say a serious well, he had a serious enough injury in that it was you a know, grade 2 hamstring wasn't it yeah it was so I think to be honest you know they've played without him up until now they've tested a lot of players I think you know knowing for a lot of players this is going to be their final opportunity potentially to get their name on a on a sheet for starting the round robin no one yeah. Adrian Mullen likes to come back I don't think you risk him in such an intense match like this now he might play him he might you know say Adrian you're going on here and I don't care what happens you're coming off at half time but I don't see the point in doing that either so I yeah. think they'll want him no one like again because we see how how busy the round robin is if you have you want an injury to be 100% right because otherwise it'll start to creep back in halfway through the round robin series if you're playing the whole time and Adrian Mullen will be playing the whole time for Kilkenny. yeah sure it's two weeks it's two weeks after the league final yeah so I don't think he will I don't like you know if Kilkenny go out and they lose this match it's not a, it's not like you're going to kill their confidence so yeah. they don't need to go out and play you know your TJs your Adrians and that they just need to go out and play the best team that is you know I suppose fit and available to them at the time and you know any lad who I don't think any player will have any doubt going out on the pitch, you know, because they've tested, like I said, they've tested a lot of players here. So there's no player going out a bit rusty here. They've had good quality tests over the league. So there's no need to go out and try Adrian Mullen if there's any doubt in his injury. Yeah, I hear Would you know we'll get a few minutes into TJ though, Paul, given that right, Mullen's a different situation where he's coming back off a uh, muscle injury and you don't want to take any kind of risk. I, I'm with you. I think going Cody plays if he's fit he comes in he's your captain for the year he's definitely going to play. But would you not want to get some minutes into TJ's leg before championship? Yeah, potentially no. you could. Um, yeah, I don't. It's it. I don't think so because, like, you know, you're you're going to be playing West Mees. You're going to have chance to you know in, introduce TJ into the game and build up into it. Like again, yeah, maybe he hasn't been hurling, um, but there's an opportunity there where you know you can build TJ back into this team. And again, look, I know he's not like he's in incredible condition, but he's not a machine either, and he's had a long year, and he himself has had his own groin injury, so. I don't see the need to throw him in, in the Limerick match. And again, if you're playing him in the Limerick match, you're not playing him for 70 minutes. You're playing him for 30, 35 minutes. So I think the intensity of training and then they have enough time to step into the round robin to build TJ up into the round robin. So I don't see the need in the league final to play him. Yeah, and there's no point racing him. I, I'm no. saying this like in, in, in racehorse in terms. There's no point putting him out to say. Yeah. Like he, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a thoroughbred, right? And he just needs to be getting you know getting I suppose a few minutes into the legs against Limerick he'd be he'd be perfectly fine you know playing in, in the round <clears> robin and, get, and getting his I suppose getting his legs right yeah. there and, and, and moving towards the, the latter end of the championship um, but look it's the beauty of sport to go back to your question Will right I know I, I, I 
diverted there for a moment but um, Beauty Sports so and, Nash, and Nash has one opinion thinking it's remarkably close and I am the, the polar opposite yeah I won't say the completely opposite but like I think that if Limerick pull out a strong team which which you know they've got they've got a very strong panel so whatever team they put out is going to be strong and I just think Kilkenny are a bit you know they're I think they're that Kilkenny team that they're putting on at the minute is probably a year or two away from their absolute peak I think they can be very good I, I think in a year 18 months they can be top top drawer but just where <clears throat> where each team is at now in, in their I suppose they call it their lifespan whatever you want to call it you know Limerick are at the absolute peak of their powers and I just think if if the weather is good, that the pitch is going to be good, obviously. And Limerick are so used to, to it's like muscle memory for them at the moment playing in games of this magnitude. And I think it's going to be Limerick by honestly seven or eight. Yeah. Do you reckon Limerick want to go out and pick up a win like that as well, Skell? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I think I think they've got the old you know Manchester United attitude back in the in the early two thousands, whereby if they get ahead of you, they just want to keep pile driving you and pile driving you. And like we, I know someone mentioned of the psychological aspect of it. But you can reverse that. So if, if let me go ahead and let's say potentially beat Kilkenny by 12, 13 points, like what, what would that do? I know Kilkenny people are different. <laughs> mm. I've said that numerous times on the podcast, you know, that they mightn't think as, as much into it as, as other counties, let's say. But if you beat, like if, if they come away with a 10 point beating, you know, that's, that has to stick in your mind somehow. Somehow. Like, do you agree, disagree? Like, if you bring back in one or two or three players, the Kilkenny team, are they going to make up 10 points? Jeez. And the make are awesome. That's, they're, they're actually, they're. they're they're probably two gears ahead of where they were in the Ireland final last year. Would you agree? At the minute, right now, they're two gears ahead in my view. Yeah, definitely from where they were last year. Well, see, it's Keane Lynch coming back in. I just think he's sewing it all together so well. Like, you know, yeah. I just think he gets so much out of the lads around him that, yeah, I think they are. Like, I mean, they're light years ahead where they were, to be honest, this time this last, last year. year. Like, I, yeah. Yeah. I, made, I, made a I made a statement after the bet, um, after the bet Cork in the Ireland final in 21. I said that if you take out Peter Casey and Seamus Flanagan and put in two other lads, they'll get on just as well because the, the Limerick system is so effective. And like that was proven to a degree last year when you take out the hurler of the year and Key Lynch. Now he's come back and he's, he's come back in, in fine form and now the system is just, it just seems unbeatable. And like look what they did to Tipperary with five All-Stars on the bench. Mm. You know, there's no other county, there's, there's no other county that can rest quality like the likes of Hayes and Flanagan and Hegarty Jesus like you know it's ridiculous I'm sick saying it every week <laughs> to God about how good they are but look they, 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 and they deserve all the plaudits we give them that's why when you piece it all together and you, you kind of break it down what can Kilkenny throw at Limerick and what can Limerick throw at Kilkenny it just, it's just it's far out weighing towards, towards Limerick I think you have to be honest about it though as well Skell because you remember this time last year we would have been rolling into a few podcasts in and people would have said you know just Limerick did nothing in the league really um, they played okay against Clare they beat Offaly in the last round then they had their bit of a break and there were definitely a few questions going into that game against Cork mm-hmm. even taking into account that Cork had taken a bit of a pasting from Waterford Cork had shown much more than Limerick at that point of the year and Limerick just rocked into gear in the first round of the Munster Championship and never looked back after that blitz yeah, like just blitz everybody pretty much yeah, cause Except we, for we, the Munster final. We were here questioning, I, I personally was questioning their squad depth when, when Peter Casey was, was down, obviously, from the final year previous, and then Key Lynch got injured, and we were saying, geez, Les, there are one or two injuries away here from, you know, from being, I suppose, like having a skeleton squad. Mm. Look what they did. I, I don't even think they were operating 100% last year, truthfully. I, I honestly believe that when they played Galway in the semi final, I saw them in person, they were operating it around the 80 mark. And like for Galway to get within a, 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 a one score game of them, they were operating at 90, 95 mark. That's just that, that. That's a good from quality that you can't match at the moment. So does that mean, Scal, that if we say we get like a Clare Munster performance from last year again at some point this year, or even Kilkenny who pushed them quite close at stages within the All Ireland final, that this Limerick team can actually bring their level up a bit more? Yes. Yeah. Like if you ask me, when, when was the Limerick ceiling reached? I don't think they've reached it yet. Honestly, I, I would probably everyone I think nationally would probably look at the Tipperary Munster Munster game alone in Parky Queen a couple of years ago. Yeah. When they were down by a, a lot, I don't have the score at hand, and they came back and they said, "Right, Limerick have reached their peak." No, like when they, in the final against Waterford, they were awesome. The final against Cork, they were awesome. Continue last year, they did what they had to do, but I just I still think they're heading up the way. And we discussed their their median age last last week, and it's not it's by no means 31, 32. You know, it's twenty eight. So like the, the legs in this team are still relatively fresh and I think they're going, I honestly think they're looking at Kikini doing the four in a row and just fell shy of the five and say, right, we're heading for that definitely. Yeah. And that's well within their sights in fairness. 
No, it is. I, I think that Munster final, from memory, I think there were 12 points down at one stage. Might have been 11 at half time, but it was it was double digits anyway. And we remember last week that they're up 69 across the last 11 games in the second half against Tipperary, which is just absolutely remarkable stuff. And, you know, we see that pattern, Paul. We see the way that they tend to come up to the occasion. But do you take some heart, even if the personnel are a little bit different, from the way that Kilkenny took them on in the All-Ireland final last year? Because remember, Kilkenny and mm. Limerick have played each other not that many times in the last few years. Yeah, absolutely, I do. Um, you know, that was it was a great performance. Like you don't, it's it's strange coming away from an All Ireland final and saying, you know, you see, you can make peace with it because Limerick were just a better team. But you were so proud to see how Kilkenny went at them and played, and that's the thing that, you know, I, I'm able to sit here and say in the league final, just at the moment, just reason of logic, my head over my heart, I just see that where Kilkenny are at and where Limerick are at, that Limerick have just that too much for them. But I know that when Kilkenny you know, under Derek Ling and like they need a few months just to get exactly what they want to do into the, into full motion. That, you can't just do that overnight. And then have their strongest 15, you know, everything, all bets off, you know, there's no such thing as wrestling players now, you're going at Limerick later in the championship. I know that those Kilkenny players, regardless what's being said outside the dressing room, will believe that they can go and beat Limerick, regardless if we sit here and the neutral sits there and picks apart man for man on the team, can they go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Limerick? And we and let's say all the pundits say no, and everybody else says no, that Kilkenny team will still believe they can go and do it. And that, that belief and that ignorance in some way is what teams are going to need to go and actually undo this Limerick team. And like... Uh, like sport is the, the thing with sport is that you just don't know what's going to happen in that I think a lot of people look at when we played Limerick back in 2019 and say oh, only for we bet them then that they would have done five in a row now I don't think they would have because there was a naivety in that Limerick team that day they had all the skill all the strength all the power, but they just had an experience being caught on the hop that was all it was and they got caught in the hop now if they went and won the All-Ireland that year they probably would have been caught in the hop the following year because you have this confidence, your feet start to come off the ground a small bit and suddenly this team comes along and takes the wind out of your sails. The reason so I you're saying are... that you poke the bear and you have created this monster essentially. No, I think I think it was just a he case poked of... the bear, he slapped him across the hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's been running since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, look what we've done now. But definitely, I, it, it is. Like, I mean, so many of the, the things you have to learn uh, at this level, some are tactical, some are skill, you know, some are mental skills. And one of those was a mental skill. Like they arrived that day. And I always go back to the, the, the quote Tommy said after we played Galway in 2012 in the Leinster final. We we came to play a game, they came to win a game. It was just a different attitude. And when you're if you're if you're going to try and achieve a five in a row, which Limerick are very capable of doing, they need to have experienced the full realm of everything they can possibly experience to go and take that on. And one of those things is every day you go out, you treat your opposition with full respect and contempt as well. That you know, these lads could come and beat us. So let's be absolutely incredible. And they are at that stage now. And I'd agree with Skell and, and uh, who was it said during the week that they don't think this, this team has peaked yet. I still don't think this Limerick team has peaked. I still think they're capable of more and they're going to show us more. But you can never say never with sport that a team just come along and just catch you. And that could be the danger. And again, you never know. Like, I mean, touch wood, we want to see Limerick playing with all their best players. But injuries could catch them. You never know in a Munster Championship. Yeah. They could pick up one or two injuries of really influential players. Like, what happens if Declan Hannan goes? Like, I mean, I know lads will look at your, your key and Lynch's and all this, but what happens when the Wait, person that keeps the ship on the, like, keep, keeps you know, everyone together? Go I'll on. Tell you who, steer, who steers the ship, not to cut across you. I know well, it's, a, it's Nicky Quaid. Like if you ever look at Limerick, right? In fairness, listen to me now. If you ever if you ever look at Limerick, <laughs> I didn't know I, I'm trying to make a statement now. And and they play league games and yeah. the sub goalie goes in. They're not the same. They're just not the same. But there you are, Scale. And they that's build, exactly they build, they build so much off him. And I know we look yeah. at Lynch and Hayes and Hegarty. It's proven now that they don't miss a beat without with Ophelas. But if yeah. he goes down or he's missing. But there you are. And 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 maybe like you know, I might have said Hannon there, but maybe Nicky Quaid is the one. And let's say, for example, you know someone like Nicky Quaid for some reason can't play one or two matches and also then you know your Keen Lynch's and obviously touch wood and all that, that these players don't yeah, get injuries fairness, yeah. but now suddenly teams start smelling blood and does you know the, the, this team has a huge amount of confidence but look the, you don't know what you don't know and until these things potentially happen there could be anything and, and in two years time we could be sitting here going only for they were so unfortunate with injuries or only for X, Y and Z just saying that there's so many there's so many variables there that could happen yeah. that, you know, but I do believe, bringing it back to the point, I do believe that in 2019, let's say, 
not take you know not take, that they were taking credit for that but if you do look back at lots of things that Limerick did that day they don't do it anymore because I think they just kind of said to themselves like that was a big learning curve for them and a bit of growth that what do you they, think they've changed since 2019 then it's just uh, since 2019 like if you look at when they dropped their head it, uh, for times in the first half there when they couldn't figure out we were after kind of making them a small bit punch drunk really they just weren't expecting it now they, they recuperated when they were in the half time and they came out really strong but the game was probably just about one at that stage they don't do that anymore like as in they don't drop the heads at any stage anymore they just keep going and going and all across the pitch they fight but you can look to examples where like and we could even hear it on the pitch where maybe lads were just getting on to each other and giving out. I don't see them doing that anymore. And like they're young players. We all did it when we were young. We all kind of had to learn this trait of not losing the head, keeping the head up. You know, okay, you hit a wide or you don't raise a ball. Yeah, you move on to the next ball. I think they've improved that massively. And it's just this kind of resilience they have now that, you know, they're not that raw kind of green team that they were maybe back then who were just, you know, in the early stages of winning. They, they have come through a lot of challenges since then and that I think has galvanised like I mean the skill is abundant the, the fitness is abundant but you look at last weekend they went in at half time came out two two wides let's say one was dropped short which Peter Casey yeah. scored and one did a drop into the keeper's hands and like remarkable second half that's the kind of mental strength they have now that maybe they didn't have in 2019 so those are just a few things for me that like is it's where they are now at the moment. But yeah. I always believe that there's you can you can always get caught in sport. You Murph, can always be caught. When did you make your debut for Kilkenny? Random question now. I'm, get, I'm getting there, okay? Just give me a chance. <laughs> right. <laughs> Cook, go on. Now, when, did, when did you make your debut? Championship or just proper early Ch- debut? Championship debut. Uh, Wexford, Wexford Park, 2011. 11. So, <clears throat> Kilkenny went, you went, uh, you went 21 games unbeaten from 06 to 10 in Championship. So you you came to you after, yeah? Yeah. Uh, Limerick are currently on 16 from 20, 21, 22, three years. So if they win their Ireland this year, they'll surpass the championship record for beating games, am I right? They're only on, they're only on 16? Yeah. Oh, right? there was no There was no round robin in, in 2021. <clears throat> okay. So... 16, I'll, tr- I'll trust your maths here now. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, doubt question, you. There's going to be a list here that's going to correct me, but I'm pretty confident. This is the stupid stat I do in my spare time. Just you sound about right, go on. Yeah, so like, if they win their Ireland this year, so I'm just, I'm just saying like, in, in terms of where they're heading, I'd say that's well within their sights. To surpass that and, and, yeah. and head, head, head for the five in the row if they can. Yeah. So, random, not, sorry, I apologise. <laughs> it, might be, it might be higher than 16, is it? I'd say it has to be higher than 16, doesn't it? Well, With the round well, robin, are you including round robin? Yeah, 2021, 22. Yeah, because COVID year was a much shortened year. Remember that? Yeah. 2020. Hmm. I might have to stat check this, but let's say they're on course yeah. to go for the 21, right? Let's, let's just take that as a possibility. In a few weeks' time, they go 21 or past it. Yeah, the cure dog monster. Would it be more impressive scale for them to do that than Kilkenny of the late 2000s, given that they've had to play the Munster Championship round robin a few times in that run as well? I'm going to have to say it is, yeah. I, I think, I just think there's... So that, remember now that was Kilkenny over five seasons where they came through <clears throat> again I, I'm, I'm probably cutting off my nose despite my face here they came through a relatively simplistic Leinster Championship at, at the time that position mm-hmm. wasn't there you know truthfully speaking mm-hmm. as, as uh, in comparison to where it is now whereas in, in Munster there's competition every year you know in fairness in fairness like yeah. I, I think if you look at Munster every year you could say potentially there's three if not four major Ireland contenders whereas in Leinster yeah. you'd probably say there's two and, at, and on a good year possibly three and no, so before I get banned from Kilkenny Skell, I'm going to point out there that that Kilkenny team had to deal with really good tip sides and Cork teams and they won some very comprehensive All-Ireland Finals. So not for a moment am I playing down their achievement. But I'm just saying over the course of the stamina of championship that Limerick have had to deal with in recent years, yeah. there's something incredibly impressive about that. Yeah, it's very, I, in fair, but again, look, at, I, I'm just saying, first of all, we had a COVID year in 2020. Hmm. So, so that was a compressed season, if you like. And then the amount of matches they play in a season is, is more than what... what the Kilkenny's would have played in the past if you remember Kilkenny would have got into the straight to the Leinster semi-final because they won it every year mm. Leinster final then onto a semi-final and final so they played probably realistically speaking four max five games a year whereas Limerick are, are playing that in Munster uh, if they get to the Munster final they're playing six am I right so that's just out of Munster mm. you know so they're playing eight at a minimum so like it's, it's fair going that's 
<laughs> Jesus. Do you know, Paul, the one thing he didn't say, and I was sure this is what was going to come up next, well, he was going to say it wasn't until Galway got into Leinster that Kilkenny actually got a challenge. <laughs> well, we got in in 2009, okay? Mm-hmm. And Kilkenny whipped us in the Leinster semi-final until the war. <laughs> so I didn't say that too loudly. <laughs> Galway started well in that game, though. Galway actually, I remember the Cannon got a goal. Cannon got a goal and he did this weird thing like he's washing he his did face. Jo- John, yeah. Cena, yeah. John Cena. I remember that. Yeah. John Cena, sorry. Thought he was washing <clears> his face. Were you, on, uh, were you on the panel then? Yeah. Was that the time you all had stuff written on your wrists and stuff like? No. Remember there was a period that there was a good few Galway lads had stuff written on their... No, I started... When I started or written on the back of their hand and that. Work like dogs. Oh, Murph, sort of come here. Uh, there's a lot of people locally <laughs> want me to write a book because I started in 07, right? Right. <laughs> in the Jerlock years, 07 and 08. <laughs> Why God, I tell you, I'd have to... I'd be on chapter 20 before I get to 2009. <laughs> <laughs> With all the stories I'd have about 07 and 08. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hold on there, Skell. Tease out Murphy's point there for a second, though. What was the writing on the wrist tape and the hand all about? Um, I remember vaguely that there was like I think Canning when he did that he had something written on his hand but I do remember there was now it was a very short period of Galway a few players just having things written on like wristbands on their hand or on their yeah. hurl or on the back of their hand or something it was like a reminder during the game that we you're looking like I think in, in different ways so when you have one right you're looking for an angle you're looking for a different yeah. way of doing things and I'd say well, we, we've had our fair share of sports psychologists let's say every team has anyway Mm. and they all come in with something different and this is probably off memory something that a sports psychologist came in and said that this will fix you <laughs> do you know what I mean <laughs> and signs are showing fucking didn't fix us <laughs> so, 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 no move on <laughs> I, I'm assuming Canning was a big WWE fan then if he was doing the scene of celebration you just say I don't remember him I, I don't remember that I remember he's a big golf fan for sure no I could be wrong but I'm fairly I sure it was definitely, it was that definitely was John you, Cena you yeah. can't see me remember that was yeah. a big thing well, John, probably, there was, I don't I, like I, I truthfully, truthfully, I don't know the backstory. So, I know. There's only one man to ask now. You may text Canning and just ask him, what was it about? It was something anyway. It had to be something. I'll text him now, but he's, you, know, him, you, won't, you won't text him back till Tuesday. He no, no, on, come on, send, send him a text. Yeah, this, might, this might actually be pod history that he might well come back to you. He's probably waiting around <laughs> seeing for the Sunday game because we're recording on Sunday this week. So let's see what Canning comes back with. Just find out if he was a big Cena fan. It is WrestleMania weekend, so why not find out? <laughs> We're branching out into every sport here now. Right, he's he's going to send the text to his yeah. uh, fellow Galway minor mentor in uh, Joe Canning. Murph, how do you see it going? I mean, he's said they're going, you're going to get blown out. Kilkenny going to be beaten by six or seven points. How do you actually see it going next Sunday afternoon? Um, look, I think I think in the early stages, even up to half time, uh, I think we're going to see a savage performance <clears> of Kilkenny <throat> again. Kilkenny will value the challenge they're going to get from from playing against a really good Limerick team. I don't see them like in, in hurling six points isn't a huge hammering. Like I mean it's a beating, all right, yeah. But I don't see it being a huge hammering. Whereas if, if a team turn around and get a football, you're beaten by six, like they quantify that as being an enormous hammer. But I just see coming down the last 15, 10, uh, 10 or 15 minutes that maybe Limerick will just have that small bit more and that bit more of experience, a bit more cuteness, a bit more flow to their play at the moment. Um, like Kilkenny will have to be really efficient with their shots and with getting their scores, which they've shown in stages and in bouts that, that they're well capable of doing it. But then we've also seen stages where you know Kilkenny will go away from the game going, you know, we still, we're still we still working to get to where we want to be. And that's the thing. It's not a negative thing that I think where Kilkenny are at. They're still building. And as I was saying, they're still building under Derek Ling. We're seeing lots of players in different positions. We're seeing players coming back. We're seeing young players being introduced. So there's lots of things there, whereas you don't have that with the Limerick team. And that counts for a lot. So that's just the way I see it going. I think Kilkenny will... Will, will really go at Limerick and, and you know, they won't be caught by the day that's in it. I just see that the last 10, 15 minutes in an enormous battle that Limerick will know how to close out that match because they're just that team. And if it clo- closing it out by getting that two scores, bringing it out to possibly six points, you know, so speaking with my head at the moment, and I kind of would rather, sounds like a funny thing, I'd nearly rather if Kenny are still building at the moment because there's such a long way to go this year that if that means going out and losing by four or five points at the weekend, whatever it is, but <clears> that they're building and they're going to, you know, really take a scalp off Limerick later in the championship. Well, I think any Kilkenny supporter would take your, take your hand off for that. Yeah. Uh, I know we've got loads of questions to answer and I know Skell has put 11 different drafts of his team to beat Limerick <laughs> together. So we will yeah. get to that in a moment. Like, I don't, I don't like these questions because I, I just know, like, it's I, like, look, 
Like, before I came on the pod, lad, I have three different notepads, and I don't know which <laughs> is my actual team. <laughs> you know, so which is your most have. important notepad? It has to be in that one. Well, I have, like, I literally have, look, look at all the paper, like, look at all the paper I have. Like, it's just, <laughs> oh, God. How much is this gnawed away at your week? Because we may as well do this now. I was going to say, let's go to the Division 2A final and off your back. But we can wait until after we do our team to beat Limerick, because I well, know I it's been eating you up. I won't let you guys, I have a club mate of mine, a good friend, is going away, right, today. And he, was, he said, come down to meet us at, at four o'clock. I I sat down today. <laughs> I sat down today at twelve, and I I couldn't leave the place until I got this team right. And before I knew it, it was fucking six o'clock. Yeah, and I'm all day at these these teams, and I'm watching the games, and I'm at the teams, and I watch the games. I tell you, I started this morning. I said I was having a cup of coffee this morning, so I'm going to start the two teams, and I rattled out the fifteen to beat Limerick. So obviously we haven't said it yet, but we also have our fifteen Sunday game to do as well. But. Right, let me 15. I went, geez, that's a good team. And I'm looking at the page I wrote it on now, and I'd say five of the players off it are gone by the time this evening came around. Like, I went off, did a few jobs, and I was down to town. I went, geez, actually, you know, that's uh, I don't know about him, or I could move him here. Well, so, yeah, sure, that's easy. It's not simple. Are we, are, we going, are we going straight into it? Are we, are we, are I, think, we I think we have to. The people can wait no more. This was Electric Diddy <laughs> on Insta last week. For anyone who missed the pod, and for whatever reason, you're just joining us in episode nine as opposed to episode eight. Uh, the question that Electric Diddy asked was, team from the best of the rest to beat Limerick. And we kind of danced around it a little bit last week because we were nearly mm. two hours into the podcast and I needed to go to the match. And we said, right, <clears> let's <throat> uh, put this on ice. We'll go have a quick think about it and we'll come back with the teams. I didn't expect Scale to message. I think it was on like Wednesday and say, I've already gone through three different versions of this date. So I knew <laughs> this was going to be good. That was Wednesday, yeah. <sighs> so right, given that Scale has put in all the work with 11 different variations before he got to his final team, the floor is yours to start with Scale for your 15. Right. No, I have a board, but you have to give me time to explain, okay? I, I don't mind. If the, as I said, the floor is yours. Oh, explain my, whatever yeah. nuances you need, explain them through. And, and there's methods to my madness. All, Mur- <laughs> all Murphy's in goals, okay? Correct. Uh, Owen O'Donnell is cornerback. Okay. Right. Now, D- Murph, you're allowed to make it, right? He's injured. He didn't make it. I couldn't make my team up. <laughs> <laughs> Your team is already. Go Dahi on. Burke is number three. <clears throat> right. Kieran Dice is number four. I'll come to that, okay? I'll come to that, right? <laughs> Interesting. Tyke de Burke is five. Ronan Maher is six. And Joseph Cooney is seven. I'll come to them. Norm McGrath is eight. Carl Mannion is nine. Tony Kelly is 10. TJ Reid is 11. <laughs> I'm getting to the good the good lad. Adrian Murnan is, is 12. Uh, Owen Cordy is 13. Johnny Glynn is 14, right? Okay. Ah, Jesus. Ah, no, 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 no. Let me explain. Johnny Glynn is 14, right? Uh, Connor Whelan is 15, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you said my team was biased <laughs> no 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 hold on a second I have to explain Fairness, New York is represented there well done the, their yeah. rules right the rules stipulated that actually yes Murph the New York is represented New York well done fair play to you yeah. Yeah, this, isn't, this isn't them coming home tomorrow and playing on Tuesday right this is with a bit of time a tour okay. uh, I marked Johnny Glenn and I've got hands up I'll still say he's one of the toughest fellas I've ever marked great hurler but go on fire away I, I, I honestly thought this would have to come from teams who are playing the championship go on anyway <laughs> But the, the, see, <clears throat> the rule wasn't stipulated. He, he no, just said the, the rest of Ireland, right? And I know he's not, he's in America. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he'd come home at some stage, right? Yeah, like, so I, Cullen I, in I, the I, other corner. I, I Michael Cousin in the corner of the box. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he was a big man. <laughs> just, I, I hit him a shoulder one day, right? And I swear to God, I'm still <laughs> looking for my collarbone. <laughs> 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 I was still looking for my collarbone. He was a behemoth, that lad. Johnny <laughs> Lynn. Yeah, God. well, like, see, like, Johnny Lynn. Johnny Lynn and Fergus. Johnny Glynn, as a fairness, is, is, a, is a terribly difficult proposition for anybody, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm just trying to give a bit, a bit of, I'm trying to give another dimension to the game, right? So if he's at 14, we can go along. Cody and Wheel on the, on, the, on the corners and, T, and Tony Kelly and Adrian Mullen, we can run it and we can go short. No bother. We've all bases covered here, that's. And I have Kieran Jice then to go up Glenn's hole. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I have to say. You have Kieran Jice for a man marking job there, is I have it? Kieran Jice for, for, for Glenn. I have uh, Dahi Burke and Owen Donnell then to go between Flanagan and Casey between them. I'd say, right, let's get after them. Okay. So Rona Maher is marking Hegarty. Rona Maher, no, I have Joseph Cooney on Hegarty. Okay. Rona Maher is where? At six. Then draft back. Oh, Joseph six. Cooney could do it. And Tiger Burke is wing back. Okay. Great, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have him staying stay, stay with Morrissey. The tricky one was the midfield, lads. <laughs> Wasn't the full forward, no. <laughs> Not at all. 
Like, okay, I <laughs> won't like... was an awful boss. I had Frank was... Cummins inside in the middle of the field there now. Yeah, I had Joseph Cooney Sr. Um, <laughs> but I tell you, I had, uh, I had Ozzy Gleeson and I took him out. Yeah, I'd, uh, yeah. Where are we going to play Ozzy? Half huh? midfield. I said, Jason, you get right. off. <laughs> you, <laughs> you didn't have over team this lads getting sent off and everything no I tell you in my first couple of teams right so in the first team over here right I had as in at 8 I actually had no, no McGrath and you looked at that and you said he could get sent off yeah, I said no no if this and Willow happened, Dunahoo there now he get sent off yeah I said this, this could happen I said the throwing I said you could have you could have a clear in Washford where, where you have looking Colin Lynch pulling like mad this could be a throwing job red card Lynch <laughs> wasn't expecting to get a mention here so <laughs> Michael Cousin Johnny Vin Colin Lynch Johnny Vilkin didn't oh Jesus Christ yeah I know Joseph Cooney Senior uh, I'm feeling better about my team I thank God I was, that's why I, when these teams come up I actually get oh God see Scott that's the beauty of you now I was there going and said he's way more analytical than I am and he'll break this down and he'll make a show of me pulling players out but then I forgot about the, your Jekyll side of you where it's like your the romance comes in and you're just going to want to kill lads so that's good uh, happy day <laughs> I, I'm giving you points for originality here, Scal. There is no way Johnny Glynn was going to make it into any team I was thinking about, but there you go. I'm, swe- I'm actually sweating here. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Glynn, like, uh, he's oh, so good geez. in the high ball. Like, <laughs> like he's no fucking... One, there's no one down here. <laughs> like, Johnny Glynn is so good in the high ball, he'd fucking catch a fucking airplane. So he would <laughs> so good, geez. It's no wonder he's good in the high ball. He's over on the Empire State Building every day living in New York. <laughs> How many years is it since he's hurled into county hurling, by the way? Uh, I, I think 18 was the best year. Oh, yeah. I'm sweating. Or 19. I don't even think it was 19. I think it was 18, yeah. No, here, I'll, in terms of conditions, I'll hold my hands up. He was one of the toughest lads I ever marked. But he, was, he was actually great for that's Mark, because he, you'd be black and blue after him. And I always said, it, black and blue after him. But you'd always shake hands and you'd be nearly laughing at each other. An absolute him, gentleman. Was, yeah. Gent. A gentle yeah. giant, yeah. He's the nicest fellow you'd meet, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And by God, when he's on the pitch, he he oh like he cut nettles. When we when Just, we played when we played G up in um Tullamore, remember the remember the year, what was it, that 2014, I think it was, where the draw. The draw. I think he came on that day and he caused me a bit of butter. Whoever changed around, he came on me and the bit of size, and we were out around wing for he was wing forward, I was wing back, just marking each other. And he got the better of me for the second half of that. I, I think it was that game. And the following week then, I remember I was like, I have to win a ball on this fella now straight away because, like, you know, he did win the second half on me. And I caught the first ball and I popped it off to Parik Welch. And Parik hit it into TJ and TJ scored a goal. And I remember going to myself, like, a lot hinged on me winning that ball over Johnny Glynn because he, he'd mentally, he'd beat you, like, you know. Yeah. Like, once he starts catching balls and running at you, he would say, you know, it was some experience. He's like a swimmer, Murph. His, his wingspan is longer yeah. than his height. Oh, Do you know what I mean? So yeah. like he's six five and his wingspan when his arms out is is longer. Yeah. Like I remember after that game, then he, like after he came up to two of us, men laughed and he shook hands and was like, uh, "I said fair play to you, you know, best of luck or whatever." And then he he was like, "Jez, brilliant, fair play to you, you know, the whole lot." Like you know, a very nice fella, very nice. Yeah. Fella. Grateful forward. <laughs> so go on. Okay, who's next? Les? You've, you've laughed enough at me. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> waiting for my chance. Anyway. I'm half expecting Eddie Carroll uh, to be on. That was good. One. That was good. I I don't I don't even have to explain my lads anymore now at that rate. But anyway. So, <clears throat> right, starting strong with Kenny lads, all right, but anyways, bear with me. Right, so I'm going Murph, so Scruff in the goal, Owen Murphy, mm-hmm. Mikey Butler, Hugh Lawler, Owen O'Donnell. Well, put that one down in the chart for the Mikey Butler mentions for the season. You have Hugh Lawler, how did I work? I do, bear with me now. I knew you, I knew it. I was going to write it down, so I knew he jumped. He better be at there. six. He better be at six, or it'll be nice. Go on. Bear, he's, bear he's, he's, going, he's going for combinations here, Skell. These are lads me, who are familiar I'm going with each other. beating Limerick, and the, these are my 15, right? Podrick Welsh, Dahi Burke, Ronan Maher. Safe shifter. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I was looking at it going, he's going to kill me now for Dahi Burke. And I knew you'd jump. I knew you jumped to go and you wouldn't have patience to go, no. oh yeah, he, he, yeah. He, maybe he has him in the wing. In the yeah, I'm expecting JJ and Jackie to play as well, they're not. <laughs> the you were the one that reached into the vault there, dusted the cobwebs off Johnny Lane and fucked him in full forward. Oh, Johnny, turn your boots, buddy. Yeah. And you had a nick, you had a nick to say it. <laughs> JJ and Jackie. Anyway, right. Padraig Welsh, Dahi Burke, Ronan Maher. Midfield, Adrian Mullen, Jamie Barron. Mm-hmm. Connor Cooney, Tony Kelly, Owen Cody. Connor Whelan, TJ and Shane O'Donnell. Interesting. Shane O'Donnell, who didn't make your all-star team last year, gets in here. He didn't. And you know what, right? Here are the terms and conditions of my one. Yeah. I had Tony Kelly at midfield and 
I had Jamie Barron and then I put Adrian Mullen out there and I was like, it was niggling with me not having Jamie Barron. Like Jamie Barron was in the top three hurlers when, you know, under Liam Cal, when Watford were going well and the ground he covers, you're going to have to cover ground. Give me your and forwards again there, Mark. Connor Cooney, Tony oh. Kelly, Owen Cody, Connor yeah. Whelan, TJ and Shane O'Donnell. Okay, now first I had of all, I looked like an absolute prick because I didn't bring Connor Cooney. <laughs> I was surprised. I was absolutely shocked. By I was it. I was looking at the stats, right? So Connor Cooney, in forty eight is games he's played, he has thirty three hundred and seventy eight. So he has three hundred and thirty two. Wait, no, is that right there? Yeah, I think he's three hundred and thirty two. Basically, points is what he scored. Now, bear in mind, he wasn't on the freeze for a long time either because yeah, Canning, was, Canning, was there. Canning was on the freeze. That's, that's enormous scoring. And then you have huge physicality there as well. And like, he's been player of the week, I think one of the weeks even in the league. Do you know, he's been really good. <laughs> like you put Johnny Lynn in ahead of Conor Cooney. I'm sorry to just keep going back to this now, but anyway. Um, was it Rosenton? Well. My team, about, my team about your team. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> team who, who, team. who else? Right, so do, do you know who actually was a tough one there now? Shane O'Donnell. Not for the reason I was tough, but him in. But I was yeah. looking at Shane O'Donnell, Desi Hutchinson, or Patrick Horgan. Desi Hutchinson, I was there going, like, he'd, they're, like, he'd create savage space for Conor Whelan and TJ there. Like, I mean, they have the physicality to call him ball and if Desi Hutchinson. But I just think Shane O'Donnell could drift out into that half-forward line midfield area and come out with reams of ball, you know? And he can provide that other element as well. Whereas I think if Desi goes too far away from the goal... Potentially, he doesn't have he doesn't provide as much as Shane O'Donnell does there. So, are your corner forwards, Murph, and same for you, Skell, Is part of this about trying to pin back Nash and Finn to an extent as well? What I've been looking at there is well, athleticism as well, power and athleticism. Yeah, yeah. and you're and, and, you're having two boys yeah. that are going to occupy the corner the square there, and one of them at times drifting out into the half forward line. And I think any three of those boys can do it. Yeah. Um, and I think if you have like Connor Heal and TJ there, physically they won't get out muscled. Like yeah. they're not going to win every ball. But they'll be excellent. And like I just look back at the likes of Shane O'Donnell in 2018 against Galway, like the goalie score. Shane O'Donnell could just create something and just be incredible. Even last year against Kilkenny, when Clare didn't hurl too well, Shane O'Donnell got four points in play. You know, he just still kind of goes on. And I think it's the fact that he's a bit unorthodox in what he does. Like he doesn't really play by the rule books, he just drifts. And that element of he could pop up anywhere and that he's he's quite calm in the ball and then could change direction and just comes at you. Like he made the Galway back line that day look like they were just confused. They didn't know what was after happening. So I think that element of just creativity in the full forward line mixed with, you know what you're getting out of TJ and Conor Whelan. I think yeah, it's, that's a fair statement. Yeah. I know your confidence scale about your team and a little bit less confident about Murph's team, but is the scary part about all this that I actually probably would fancy Limerick to take either of these on? That's not great now, in fairness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a bit worrisome to be fair. I know, like, I mean, there's obviously ridiculous talent there and this is like the Lions argument we were having last week is how long would these players yeah. need to come familiar with each other and whatever else. But, like, even taking a man for man, Limerick will give either of those two best selections a good rattle. Well, of course, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a yeah. fact. Yeah. yeah, that's a compliment to them. Like, it's because a compliment. As, as a collective, they're unreal strong. As yeah. a collective. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely, they would, you know. Uh, and I think the idea that we even had to come up with this idea or that when the one of the listeners did is already uh, an indication enough as to where Limerick are, you know? But uh, it's interesting though, because it's actually great when you do take Limerick out of it, it's a really interesting team because if you put Limerick into that, you don't, it's not as enjoyable because like there's lads who are just nailed down there, you know, and you miss out on so many great players. It nearly actually becomes an impossible task when you add Limerick into that. Uh, who are the Limerick players, Murph, that you wouldn't be able to leave out then? Oh, oh, Jesus. Right. Nail down that you couldn't leave out. This, is, could, going, this is going to cause for us to debate it. Well, I, yeah. did, here, I, I didn't mean to do that, but this is why we want oh. to talk. These are, you know... I couldn't leave out, right. How many, just, we may, we may, or we just, across the board, you couldn't leave them out? Yeah, yeah, across the board. Okay, across the board, I don't think you can leave out Sean Finn, Barry Nash, uh, Dirma Burns. Tell lots of the All-Ireland selectors last year, but go on. What? Well, they had to leave one of the two cornerbacks out last year to get Mikey Butler in, didn't they? Right. Yeah, but that's 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 I suppose that's different. Year. That's an all. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's, that's, Based that's on Mikey. the year, exactly. They had. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Mikey but, Butler. That's Mikey Butler. It is Mikey Butler. Yeah, but Mikey, I put Mikey Butler in centre forward. That's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, so I'm going go right nine. for me. Sean, Sean Finn, Barry Nash, Nash Dearman Burns, Burns um, Hegarty, Lynch, Hegarty, Lynch. Like even uh, Tom Morrissey, 
Yeah, Galan. Yeah, you have to leave Galan in. Like I, I think when Galan is there in that full forward line, you have to take. For me, you'd have to take Shane O'Donnell or Connor Whelan out. So yeah, Galan is nailed on. And do you know it's a tough one. The last one I'd say as well. That's for me would be very tough. Like I think Tom Morrissey is excellent. Like yeah, uh, like and ver- unsung hero. If there is an unsung hero, I think uh, of of that Limerick team. Hello. Yeah, Ky- Kyle Hayes. No. Hello. If I'm being <laughs> <laughs> anybody there. <laughs> I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just be trying to be as as cutthroat as I can. Like, well, I'll cut the short for you. Go on. I have Nicky Nicky and Seth Murphy. Of course you do. I was going to say that. You don't have to say that. You don't have to say that. But go on anyway. Nicky Quaid is in there. He's up on your mantelpiece at home beside your wedding photo. Go on. Next one. Like, okay. <laughs> Seems like I can't get time to justify that. <laughs> <I'll move on. laughs> I, I, I agree with Sean Finn. On, uh, yeah. I agree with Barry Nash. Yeah, I've been taken out for my two guys here. Um, I agree. With, I agree with Jim Burns. I have, I put in Kyle Hayes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I well, agree with Hag- your team. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with Hegarty, Lynch, and I agree with Glenn Toomer for it. Yeah. So what we're saying is they've one, two, three. They've four, half five. the team. If you were picking from, if you were like a manager tomorrow who was a Space Jam situation and you were going off to play the aliens. Yeah. You'd be picking half the Limerick team and you would probably feel you couldn't drop them. Yeah, fair yeah. enough, yeah. <laughs> with everyone available, even if Johnny Glynn was back. Even with, like, even with Johnny Glynn. Well, you're take, laughing at that. Take, you're laughing at that. Take right. out of cryogenic freezing, even with... <laughs> what, what was that film that Sylvester Stallone the unfrozen after like a thousand yeah, years? Yeah, that back. was like the, in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If Johnny Glynn came home for on the boats tomorrow morning, I think there's to be no last one. Someone in, someone in Galway needs to find oh, a job for him. That's, that's my main takeaway from this. He was actually football. involved with New York last year with the football team when we played him in Crow Park. He's been yeah. field here before, wasn't he? I don't know. Well, I think he's, 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 his dad has a football background, came from football yeah. country. I think he was midfield for New York the year previous, although I'm open to correction. Interesting. Yeah. Was he a selector or a coach or something, Murphy? What was he doing? Yeah, he was. I think he was a selector, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was chatting to him after the game, all right, yeah. He was the least bruised I'd ever been after chatting to Johnny Glynn Pro Park. Maybe Johnny Glynn, boy. <laughs> there are a load of other questions. I'm going to I, save the other 15 because we don't Can I just 15, throw in one thing, right? Go on, I, I think there now, by the time the listeners hear this podcast, I think you should throw out tonight or tomorrow. Hmm. If listeners can guess the one player that's mentioned the most this week in the Hurling Pod, We'll give them. Some, we'll come to a house, their house and do a show from their house because they're not going to guess it. They're not going to guess that Johnny Lynn is the most named, <laughs> name dropped hurler in this show tonight in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to name drop, two, four, six. <laughs> Mikey <laughs> Butler. You've mentioned his name eleven. Tw- sorry, that's twelve times now. You've mentioned his name twelve times since the start of the podcast this year. You mentioned we- Johnny Lynn twenty-seven times. At least. No, because it was I relevant. Am. It was relevant. <laughs> it was not relevant. <laughs> He's only 30, Liz. He's only 30. What do you mean? Nobody. Like, anyway. He's not even 30 until the end of the gym. All the people go... Like, oh. this, this podcast has gone into strange new directions and I can only praise it for doing so. You've mentioned yeah. Johnny Cena and Johnny Lynn. Yeah, has he, has he texted you back yet? That's obviously a no. That's a no. He hasn't read the message. I know what. You know what he said. He's he looked he at, his at his phone. He's looked at the phone. And said, oh, can't be Ashley. I've spent enough time with him in Port Leash on Saturday. So <laughs> I was thinking. Yeah, just fair. Ah, uh, stuff was funny yesterday. Oh, right. Anyway, do I, do I ask you why it was funny yesterday, or do I? Uh, because I just um, <clears throat> Aaron Island got a twenty-one. I'm going to say it in this. And hmm. like at the time of the game, we we're against the breeze, a couple of points up, and probably the safest option was to put it over the bar, and so. JC tells up Aaron to put the so pants the finger, put it up, put it over the bar, and then Aaron buries it in the net. <laughs> and he sees Joe shaking the head. <laughs> but he, as I said to him, he was as bad himself. He, he, used, to, he used to rock on a couple of 21s himself when, when, when he shouldn't have, and he scored them. Oh, so yeah. don't hold back natural talent. That's and was, was Aaron Nyland after the game praised for his ingenuity by going for goal, or did Cannon go, you do what I tell you next? Well, time? he was praised by me anyway, but if he missed it, he'd be in, he'd be in trouble for that reason. <laughs> 
Oh, Lord. Right. It was a nice little contrast, Skell, because we were reading mean tweets and mean comments to you last week. And uh, like a few people, I think it was Jim Butler who messaged us during the week and he said that he burst himself laughing listening to you having to listen to mean tweets. There were some actual really nice comments last week. So I felt I should highlight them this time around. Uh, Mark Dre, top analysis from both ex-players. Uh, done in such good humour from all the slagging. The show is fun to listen to. Yeah. Nice to hear. Nice to hear good stuff. And Fonz one one four, who we joked with Skell himself, said Skell is by far the best hurling analyst in the game. His awe for this Limerick team and clearly explaining in detail how they are so good is great to listen to. That's that's a yeah. lovely, refreshing comment, Skell. After what was said about you last week. Thanks, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> when she hears all the f bombs you dropped earlier on in the pod, you're going to be in trouble again. He just texts back. Well, he simply said that the lads in college is better. Me wouldn't do it. That was it. They wouldn't do seen uh, that. Uh, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I won't mention names. No, that's more yeah. than fair enough. I was intrieged by it. Like, this fair is enough, great. Yeah. We've got a direct line to, to Canning to find out. There you are now, yeah. Um, okay. Some of the other comments. And, some goal uh, too, in fairness, says. Can we just can we just say? That was a good goal, yeah. Some goal. Like, you never goal. see JJ caught for pace. Like, and, and they always used to say, with Kenning, he, he was slow. Kenning was not slow. Kenning was deceptively mm. quick. You know, yeah. And he got away from JJ that day and stuck it. Savage. Do you remember the one scale at Crow Park that he pulls out of the sky and just almost like in the next couple of strides he just flashes the ball across goal and into the so, top corner? Because against us, yeah. yeah. Tells that, him the one where he, he's, that's, to me, you're 15. right, and I know you say what you want, that's the best goal I've ever seen in mm. terms of difficulty. Like, if, you know, you see these freaking divers coming off and they hold up the charts for difficulty, you know what I mean? That's a fucking 9.9. Like, you know, to lose your complete bearings, do a 360 and stick it past one of the best goalies ever. Yeah. Sick. Like, I know Murphy might agree he'd pick some DJ goal or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Murph, why run it? That's the best goal you've ever seen. Ah, no. Right. Sorry, no. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Tangents are what we're all about. Go on. Yeah. Best goal I've ever seen off the top of my head. Right. I admit it was Kenning. Uh, that, was, that was a really good goal. Yeah. Um, I, is it the best one I've ever seen? I don't know. Uh, like, even... Austin Leeson's goal against Austin in 2016 in Turles was an exceptional goal. Mm. That was really good. Like, I mean, that was the one he caught it around midfield because I remember the jump. I was waiting for the break. Next thing he jumped and he was half a foot higher than everybody. Landed and from an awkward angle stuck it. That was that was good. I always, Richie Hogan's 2011, I always thought was a brilliant goal. That was the one hand-passed by Eddie Brennan. Controlled it, touches it. Yeah, and it's like top corner. It's the fact that it hit top corner. That was a good one. Just after half time. Uh, yeah. Well, no, I think it was, I think that could have been ten minutes ago, fifteen minutes ago, about fifteen minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let me think. I'll think of one, one more now, fairly neutral one. Let me think. Jane O'Donnell's goal against Galway, that was eighteen. Mentioned it earlier. That was a great goal. I had to say it, didn't you? I did. Why did like? Are you on goal? Yeah. Why did you like? <laughs> why did you have to like? Uh, sorry, I didn't actually. I did. I didn't actually. I was you admired. knew well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I you admired. Well. Do you know, my only memory of a Galway player there was just Dahi Burke kind of. Hanging off, yeah, yeah, hanging off from there. Like, and Shane Donald didn't go down. I didn't actually. If you told me Callum was on goal that day, I would have would have believed you. I didn't because, like, there was nothing that could be done. That's yeah. a compliment. I did not That's expect him. To, I did not expect him to go for goal that day. I didn't expect him to keep when going. He picked the ball. We had we had off memory. We had three lads cover, mm. and he bet one with a turn, ran through another lad, and then got through another fella, and then put under me like mm. savage goal. But he was in hot form that year. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, was, yeah. <laughs> No, no, before we get to the other questions, by the way, uh, there were some very nice comments from YouTube, so I had a quick look on them. And I apologise for how late the YouTube went up this week, but I actually forgot my laptop going to work on Wednesday. Uh, Sienna O'Dwyer says, Love Scale, very funny. Uh, Stockroom Tim, who's a regular watcher on the live chat as well on the YouTube, uh, which will be Monday this week, I promise. Uh, Will, you look way, t- look, you took way too much joy in reading those comments to Scale. He took it on the chin, in fairness. And Pwell74 said, I've seen Limerick train on a few occasions. One drill they keep doing is four by four inside a small square. They just keep possession under pressure continually. Passes the hand on the move over different distances in their whole game. Sounds very easy, but needs constant practice. That sounds a bit like uh, peak mm. Barcelona doing their rondos, Murph. Uh, making mm. sure that every stick pass and every hand pass actually gets to hand and they don't drop it as they're doing these four by four things. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think it was actually Anthony Nash made a point there um, about two weeks ago on off the ball. And he was just saying that, you know, oftentimes we can get, I suppose, a bit dazzled or distracted by all the other stuff to do, the really skillful stuff. But like, it's the basics, the fact that their ball to hand is so good. And even as well, if you look at how many times they just hold her with one hand, now it's not something you try and teach a youngster. 
But when you're at that level and you have that level of skill, you know, have the hurl really shortened down and they're just slapping it almost like a tennis racket just to each other and moving like uh, Keen Lynch popped the ball off to Peter Casey in the last game for Peter Casey to get a score. Like, and it was just, you know, seamless. And if you're able to do that, you're not going to get caught up as much. But I do, I remember seeing him playing against Kenny there a few years ago in the league and that was it. It was just this in touch tight to each other and moving the ball. And if you move the ball in those small situations, well, when you're given more space, it's no problem whatsoever. So I can understand the method behind why they put so much pressure on each other to be in these tiny spaces, but to still move the ball at a really good level. It's just, it's, it is one of the, one of the not secrets, but one of the reasons that they're better than every other team at the moment is because they can move the ball in those tight spaces. Aha, Scale, this brings you on nicely to the next comments, which come in from Instagram. Shane Power and also Esme in 15. First of all, Shane Power X. Are Limerick actually hand passing or throwing the ball but getting away with it? And Esme in 15 says, Limerick throwing the ball, story. So we talked about this a lot last year. Have yeah. the referees stopped penalising it or All are Limerick doing this more than anyone else? Yeah, like if you were to compare this year and last year, they're worlds apart. You know, last year there was probably three or four instances <coughs> in every game where they were picking hand passes, where <clears throat> you know, they're looking for the clear strike in action. Like I know as a player, right, and we all do it, Murph, you raise the ball off your hand five mil and then let yeah. off. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's very, very hard to the naked eye or to the neutral or to the person in the stand to actually see what you're doing and it looks like a throw. Mm. There are some times where I, I think, and there's two, I won't call them culprits, but there's two lads that I say, mm, you're throwing the ball a bit and I always say, well, I don't know who. He does this arc throw when he gets caught in a, in a rook. He does this mm. kind of one where he tips it out and I'm saying... You're kind of throwing the ball, buddy. And then sometimes Keane Lynch, but he's so skillful. Yeah. Maybe just that he's fooling us. That he actually is probably creating a degree of separation from his hands of the ball. Um, but it doesn't look clear. If you're looking for the word clearance like an action, I, I can't see it. I can't see it. Is it that big a deal though, Murph? Like, are we overplaying this? Because as we watch it on TV, there's oftentimes there's a quick hand pass or a slap pass or moving it to the side or whatever. And we go, that's definitely a throw. And we see it close up <clears> in the <throat> angle, which the ref probably can't see. Does it really matter that much that lads are possibly thrown it around I think it falls into the category of the four steps like does every player take four steps only when they're no they don't they take five or six potentially mostly especially if players going for a shot these steady up steps that you take that they just don't count I think it falls into the category of that like, well, well I mean if you were to blow it every single time a player took a fifth step watch how poor Kilken or Kilkenny I don't know where that was going watch how poor matches become and games become because you're aiming for four and if a player blatantly in an obvious situation and you, the crowd will get on their back when it's more than four but if you were to blow when there's a hint of a fifth step we'd have a very stop start game yeah. and I think where the hand pass is now is the hand pass is more prevalent than it's ever been in hurling at the moment it, because it's a possession based game at the moment players are moving to the player in possession popping the ball and until they're after the halfway line then they're really delivering it that's the majority of what's happening so you have I'd say tw twice, if not three times, the amount of hand pass in, in the modern game than there was in previous games. So within that, then you're going to have people who, are, again, moving in tight spaces, they might be popping the hand pass, they might not be, but they just get away with it because there's bodies in the way. They, maybe the camera can see it, but the referee can't see it. And it's hard to be, it, it, it's difficult to be hard on referees there because it, the, the matches are so tight now, there's so many bodies in the way. It might be obvious to us, might be not obvious to us. You might think the referee's been hard on the player. It's just, it's such a fine margin at the moment that I think, to be honest, the referees are implementing it as best they can. And we <clears> see <throat> it in every game pretty much now where they do blow it. But uh, what I what I think is you can't look at it as, you can't watch it in slow motion. You're not allowed to put it up on Twitter in slow motion and say, this was a throw ball. Nobody gets to see it in slow motion in real time. Mm -hmm. You have to watch it in normal time. And if it looks like a pass, it's a pass. If it doesn't look like a pass, the referee can't decide that. So I think if you like, if you go on Twitter tonight, you'll be able to find examples. I think one of them is actually Nicky Quaid and it's thrown it. Yeah, but there was probably 80 other hand passes in that game, maybe. And that could have been a throw, yeah. But like you said, Skell, he might have actually hand passed it. It's just very hard. Probably in that situation, the referee does have to blow it. Even if Nicky knows himself, he hand passes him. But if there's not clear separation, you have to blow it. But like I said, I think it's in that area now of the five steps with the hurling or with the, with the five steps where, like, do players always take four steps? No, they don't. Skell, does it concern you too much? You see, I know some people you say, again, on social media, they say ban the hand pass because they're concerned about the way the game is going at the moment. <clears throat> I just think if you ban the hand pass, yes, it'll be, but then you get an awful lot of rooks, which I think 
P- would you? Uh, players are so fish and strong that they're able to bottle you up quite quick. So if you can't hand pass it away, ball hits the deck, rooks, throw ins. You know what I mean? I just don't think. He, I think the hand pass probably it facilitated kind of the an, an open game for the last couple of years. And people, people are looking at it now as, as the game being very mechanical, if that makes sense. You know, whereas the hand pass now would probably be an area where they're saying if we get rid of that, it'll take take away a degree of the mechanics and we might get more fluidity in the game because they want to go back to the late 90s and early 2000s. That's what people want right now. They just want 15 on 15, land it down as far as you can, stay in your own position and man-to-man. That's what, that's what the, the neutral wants, you know, because they're saying that there's, the competition is kind of going over. And maybe that's got, got to do with Limerick's domination also. But I, I, I'm not in favour of taking away, like, you know, nullifying elements of the game to try and make the game more appeasing to to, to, to neutrals, I'm going to call them. Like, just, it's up to every other team to get better. That's it, you know what I mean? Simple as yeah. that. I think as well, if you get rid of the hand pass, like you're saying, rooks do happen because a player now has to resort to, let's say, <clears throat> let's say, for example, Kilkenny are playing Galway tomorrow. Kilkenny are attacking, Galway turn over the ball. Now, Mannion has the ball in a cornerback and he wants to pop the ball out to someone, but he can't by a hurling stick. Kilkenny can slow down the game like we see in football, where they just go in on top of him, create a free, sit back, and let the free be poked down on top of him, whatever, mm-hmm. grand, so they can reset. But the hand pass allows Park Mannion to even go to his knees, pop the pass out, Dahi Burke moves it out, and now the game is still moving. So we don't have this place of the game breaking down, teams being able to reset with cynical fouls. Because a player in a tight situation can pop that pass off, like you said, I think it just it, it actually promotes free flowing hurling. So I think it would actually, where you see it very marginally in a small in a small like I suppose strata of the game where lads go, oh it's it's poor in that element. I think in the greater scheme of things, it actually promotes free flow in the game. Lads being lads being really good at hand passing. Well, Murph, that brings you on nicely to the Sunday pay per view on Off the Ball earlier today. Uh, I did haven't listened to the full podcast yet. I will do it <clears> later. Um, but I did see a clip, and John Duggan was hosting today, and he said. I don't enjoy the game that is hurling as much as I used to. There are too many scores. The tension has gone a little bit out of the game. Goals mean less than they did. It's too robotic and machine-like for me. You guys are both recently retired from Intercounty. You're both still playing at club level right now. For you, is hurling less entertaining now than it was in the past? I think it's, first. I think it's more entertaining, to be honest. Um, I, I appreciate the incredible skill that is on display like even last game I was at Kilkenny and Cork okay it's, I wasn't game for the ages but I brought a neutral to that game and they were like this is incredible what people are doing like I mean the levels of skill have gone to the stage that it's actually your mistakes is what you're counted for now like people often give out to say oh players don't pull on the ball anymore the reason they don't pull on the ball on the ground is because there's less of a percentage chance of you holding on to that ball and mm-hmm. creating a score out of it so players now are incredible at rising the ball, getting it into your hand and snapping a 30-yard pass to a player uh, right to his hand so he doesn't even have to move and move it on. And I think that's the element you have to you have to look at and appreciate. I also look at hurling from the point of view that so many other sports you look at and you go, oh, when is the score coming? You know, how often did it score? Like the, the, the high level or high scoring rate of hurling, I think it's just absolutely brilliant. You know, and I, and I watch Gaelic football, I watch soccer, I, you know, watch lots of sports. But you can't compete with hurling for the amount of scores. And people some in some areas actually say that's a that's a negative because oh it's so high scoring in games. But that's because players and teams have got to such a level now where they were maximizing every element of the game that it's just reached a level that it's I love it. I just think it's brilliant. Um yeah, we're always here talking about how we could restructure championships and stuff, but certainly not for me. Um, do I not enjoy hurling as much as I used to? I, I enjoy it even more again. My argument to this one, Skell, before you come in, it would be that I think of games in recent years and at a time when people were complaining about the amount of scores as well. The Limerick Cork game in the semi final in 2018, I think in the Munster final last year, I think they're matches that stand up with anything that we watched in what we call the good old days. And even. Yeah. Like, I think people were complaining about scores even around the time that uh, Tip and Kilkenny had those incredible games, like the drawn game that year as well. Maybe that's the period people want to go back to as opposed to back to the 80s or 90s. But even then, I remember people complaining that the ball was too light, it was moving too much, there were too many scores within games. I think these games stack up with any hurling we have. Yeah, this, see, this, see, how much time do I have here, Will? Because this, I can go really deep into this, you see. I don't mind goes. <clears throat> no, I see, when you've got neutrals watching the game, right, they, they only see what's directly in front of them. Do you know what I mean? They only seen the ball moving from here to here and the score. They don't really look at the intricacies of the game. So I, I agree 100% with Morph. 
I am in awe of the likes of Limerick where they can take a score last weekend against Tipperary and they can hit six passes the full length of the pitch, let's say, walk six passes up, not one ball hits the ground. I guarantee you, and I, I make this a bold statement, the people who come at me now, in 1980s and 1990s and most of the 2000s, there was no team, no team that scored a point without the ball dropping in six passes. I bet you it wasn't. Because just the level of skill has gone to a level whereby <clears throat> we haven't seen it ever before. You know, and I, you talk about enjoying the game. I love the game now because it's much, much harder, would you, would you believe, to prepare for opposition because the level has gone way up. The level of ball, ball retention skills is crazy. Ball handling skills is crazy. The distribution has gone, gone crazy. If you don't hit a lad you know, straight to his hand beside your face, it's a bad pass nowadays. Mm. You know, there's no such thing yeah. as pulling on the ball. That's gone out of the game 10 years. <laughs> you know, if you cast aside you're pulling the ball nowadays, you know what I mean? And it's just, what, what's happened is, 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 is teams, uh, and probably hurling people as, as a whole, have honed in so much onto the game, the intricacies of the skill level, to, to get better. Do you know what I mean? So like teams looking at we have to hold the ball, the level of difficulty goes way up, but then your margin for error comes way down. Do you know what I mean? So that's why when teams go at Limerick, toe to toe and try to do the Limerick game, the Limerick plan against Limerick, they can't do it because, as I said, the margin of error is so small that if you make a fine fine mistake, Limerick turn you over. Whereas Limerick, they their their level of efficiency is incredible. There's no error. There's no error, and that's why no one can touch them. You know. So like when people say scores, yeah, I, I get what they're saying you know, as, as a common neutral. And I don't mean that to be offensive, but like they just see a point going over, a puck out, pint, puck out, rook, pint, you know, and they think it's just kind of boring or, or lethargic. I think I think personally it's incredible. I love seeing 55, 60 scores a game. So nothing wrong with that in my eyes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other thing as well is, right, watch a bit GA Gold, and I've no doubt that some of the greats of the game who we've marveled about, like a Brian Whelan or a Nicky English or a DJ Carey or any of these type of you know fantastic stickmen, <clears throat> they would uh, they would transfer perfectly into the modern game, and I reckon they would still be massive superstars now. But sometimes when you watch those matches, there's a lot of random ball murph that goes into forward lines. There's a lot of pulling on the ball just to put it ten yards up the pitch. That the possession based teams now would just go around them. Now I know mm. that's not entirely making the entertainment point but sometimes we can look at it with rose tinted glasses because i think some of us look back at you know the democratic age of the 90s where your teams like offley and clare and wexford and limerick getting to all ireland finals at the time and um you know say the big three were maybe on a slight downward trend and people enjoyed yeah. it because of the novelty but i reckon if you go back and watch it now the games are of a better standard right now than back then Absolutely, yeah. Um, and it is that rose tinted glasses. And it's really for any sport, is, is that is the case. Like you look back romantically at your own time, but you know, speaking from my own, uh, let's say when I joined Kilkenny in 2011, it was absolutely acceptable to win a ball in Rome back line and just blaze it up the pitch. And, right. all. and it, was, yeah. it was a great clearance, you know, brilliant. You go into Nolan Park, you go up to Pierce Stadium now, and you get the defender winning the ball and he just drives it. We'll listen to the groan of the crowd because they know where the game has gone now. You can't do that anymore. Turnover. And like that just shows where the game has gone because it's now more difficult. If if your only job is to win the ball and drive it up the pitch, and that's your job done, it's the forward's fault after that, whereby uh he doesn't win it. Well, like, I mean, happy days for me, like you know, but even in that 10 years, 12 years, well, it, look, it, it evolved much quicker than that. But there's so many things you wouldn't get away with. And there's no doubt about it. I'd agree with you fully. Those players back in those days, that was just the conditions in which they were playing in. And I think if you put them into the conditions now, let's say, and they grew up in this time, it's it's the attributes that they had that made them great players, that they were always willing to work harder than other players. And they would adapt and they'd put into this game. But I guarantee if we're sitting here now in 10 years' time, we'll be looking back at the game now going... Geez, those teams actually weren't as good as we thought they were. That's only because we know what we know now. Someone will come along and bring it to another level. Like this Limerick team at the moment, if you go back and they were to play the 2006 Kilkenny team, which loaded with stars, great team, they would beat them well because they use the oh. ball so much better at the moment. Well, they would. But do, you really, I'm so it, do you really believe that? Because this is the great um, what if, like people say, well, well, uh, yeah, the well, Kilkenny team nearly did the five in a row. You think Limerick would beat them and beat them well? Based on the same game, plan. game if it was a game style of what I'm, but if we were to do the, exactly as we were saying at the start there of that Kilkenny team having time and hurling to the same level, or sorry, using the same structures the Limerick team are using now, that's a different, that's a completely yeah. different. But I would say, like, you know, if you put Limerick out even against us in 2014, like the great team and men's game and stuff, but what Limerick were doing would have changed the course of the game. And you don't know after that. So all I'd be saying is that like even the greatest teams, if you go back and look at what they did on their day, it's that wouldn't be acceptable now. That's all it is. And it's it's a case of, like I said, 
in 10 years' time, what Limerick are doing right now won't cut the mustard in 10 years' time. And that's just the natural evolution of it. And mm -hmm. going back to where we all bring it, it's just that it's it's excellent to see where it is at the moment. And I, I know what John Duggan is saying, but I, as as a as a player, can recognise the game has gone to another level and I really, I really enjoy it. Yeah. Showtime Murph was in contact on Instagram as well. This is not Paul Murphy, by the way. He didn't get this fantastic username uh, before Showtime Murph put his together. Definitely um, give it to himself. Yeah. <laughs> Scale. my Hollywood name. This question could be for you. After Kilkenny, who is best placed to challenge Limerick? Showtime Murph is putting Kilkenny second, by the way. That's just the implication of this message. I don't disagree with him. Fair enough. So who's next best? Um, injury free. <coughs> You can say it all way, by the way. We're not going to slag you. There's no. Yeah, no. See, I see. I know. Like, I am going to say Galway. Like, mm. you know, they. Yeah, they are. No, I'm. Com I'm confidently going to say Galway is number three. You know, um, you're going to ask me why, you know. Well, hang on. It's not, not necessarily three. It's who has the who's best in position to go at Limerick. It doesn't necessarily have to be like they're after That's, the league now to rank three I would say oh, no, it's a very Galway. good point yeah. it's, it's yeah, for who's, me, who's horses for courses who's best to beat Limerick yeah for Galway because I, I think I think Galway have, uh, and traditionally we've always had a good mixture of strength and, uh, and ball capability you know and skill so I think Galway Galway are the best team to go at them so, uh, in, in current form I, I don't disagree with Kenny to be honest I, I think they're there on merit to be number to consider number two um, but I just think if Galway can get to the level where I think they can get to you know they can give Limerick a good shot uh, non-showtime Murph who would you pick? Um, I would, at the moment, I'd go with Cork at the moment. Did you just drop your pen in disgust? I did, yeah. I did. So he, did, no. he, did name, he did name a dumpy on it. Cause now, go on, go on. We, we've, we've talked Cork down in big games and we've talked them the fact they can't maybe get to that level and beat Limerick. So go on, explain before I throw my pen. Well, what I would say is that he is saying who... Is, the question is basically who's best positioned to have a go at Limerick. Yeah. I do believe Cork have the necessary players to have a go at Limerick. I also believe Galway do, but Galway haven't shown as much edge in this league at the moment, which I know Galway will be disappointed in, and they have brilliant players to introduce back. Like I know when the likes of, okay, Dahi Burke is back at the end, but likes of Finton Burke and these lads, Cahill Mannion, and they have those lads back in the team, but there's a few unknowns there. There's lads carrying injuries with those lads. Tonight, who's the best team after Kilkenny? I think Cork at the moment are the best team but I will say this in four or five weeks time we'll, we'll revisit that because at the start of this year I would have said Galway okay. but just based on I give Cork the credit they've, they've shown flickers of being aggressive and you know they, they've like they've really put it up to Limerick at different times when they're on, on song so I'm going to give them their credit at the moment and say Cork have the players there to go at them. Okay. Uh, this one's more a comment than a question coming in from RN80. Is Munster hurling so sacred that Kerry have to play in Leinster Interprovincial Minor Hurling Championship? The thing is, RN80, teams outside Munster, they're all coming in to play in the Leinster Championship. We spoke last week about uh, you're involved with Galway Scale, <laughs> going to play Antrim in a Leinster venue where it was Connacht versus Ulster. You've got Kerry, who unfortunately have taken a, a couple of heavy defeats in the Leinster minor so far. But this kind of reflects senior back down in a way that like Leinster is the province where teams from outside come in to get competitive games in the two tiered competitions in Leinster and Munster stick to the five counties. That's just what the case is at the moment, Scale, isn't it? Yeah, look, I, and I can see the logic behind it, to be honest, because like one would argue that the level of competition would be just, just a, a step or two too high for Kerry. Yeah, and so if they come into Leinster, there's probably a, <clears throat> it's probably more of a level playing field. Now, it's, obviously, there's a couple of teams in Leinster that can that can subject you to a hammer and two. Well, I, I, to I be fair, to Kerry, Kerry found it very difficult against both Wexford and Offaly in these first two weekends. And mm -hmm. maybe when you see the the beatings that Kildare, the Kildare have been handing out, that maybe Kildare should have been in tier one and Kerry should have been in tier two. But the tiers notwithstanding, you can probably understand why Kerry are going into that province. Yeah, I, I, I can understand it, of, of course. And <clears throat> I think if you look at the you know, the competition as a whole, they'll probably get more more from playing Leinster than playing Munster. Because, to be, to be honest, and reality would, would tell me that if they go into play Munster and they play any of the, of the, the five teams that's there at the moment, it's it's 15, 20 points all day, hammered. You know what I mean? And that's just the way the game is structured at the minute. That's just the way it is uh, for, for, for Munster. And so that's why probably Leinster is more appealing to the to the Kerries and the Antrims and, 
and, and whatnot. So it's just it's a time thing. Like it's just where 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 the game is at at the moment that they have to just um, suffer the hard road. I'm afraid. Mm. Bo Lawler is going to get me ranting about under twenties and the season and everything. But anyway, his question is: Does Derek Ling call on the three under twenties or just Billy Drennan, who is guaranteed time, and what would the players want? So the 20s are overlapping at the moment with other competitions. So mm-hmm. a lot of the teams are playing 20s on either Friday or Saturday. There's another round of games, I think, which goes across Thursday to Saturday of next week uh, with the group stage this year. And I know in Offaly's case, their under-20 captain was basically restricted in playing the Division 2A final today, Charlie Mitchell. He came on and was very impressive in the second half, but his game time had to be managed over the two days because these two competitions are running uh, overlap. And Charlie Mitchell's going to have the same issue next week when Offaly 20s play before the weekend and then he'd be playing on Saturday in the first round of the Joe McDonough. This is true of the counties in the senior championship as well, Murph, that um, it becomes very awkward for 20s who I'm sure would love to be playing both competitions, but you're taking a real risk with their game management at the moment, depending on how much you want to play them. Yeah, it's not an easy one at all. Um, And it's a tough one. It's tough for the under 20 players themselves because like under 21, when I was playing it, it's it, like there's great memories to be had there it's a great opportunity to play with your own group of players really for the last time because lots of those players won't make senior level um and it's disappointing to see that you know potentially these incredible players are going to miss out playing at the level you know that they're the big fish really at the moment you know so decisions have to be made to bring you back to Bo Lawler's question um I think Drennan is the only fella at the moment where you're saying that, you know, the senior team will go, well, like you have to look at it from the point of view to go, are we lesser of a team if X, Y, or Z isn't playing? And I think Billy Drennan at the moment, you know, he is in the top six forwards for Kilkenny. So if you're not playing him so he can play under 20, well, Kilkenny are kind of rolling the dice there and not that they don't technically have their strongest 15 out. Um, so out of the three, like out of the under 20s that are there, I think Billy's the only fella that is nailed on. Um, and I don't think he ha- they have to risk the rest of them because if you're looking over at a sideline with the calibre of players Kilkenny will invariably have on the bench, I don't think you have to cut off your nose to spite your face by, you know, overusing the under 20. So I think Billy Drennan is the only person there. Like, no doubt the lads will will find their feet over the next year or so, or potentially even around Robin comes around. But I just don't see it at the moment that you have to use all of them. For you, Skell, Tom OL 91, do Wexford have any chance in Leinster this year? Now, Tom didn't clarify whether he meant Wexford qualifying out of Leinster or Wexford winning it. <clears throat> but either way, Assess for Wexford or at if you can, given all the players they had out. Um, I will <clears throat> I'll make an assumption that the players are fit. Okay. And they've long, long, they've no long term injuries. Um, do they have a chance? Of course they have a chance, but is it realistic? I just can't see them getting past Galway or, or Kilkenny to be honest. You know, like if you're to put it into percentage terms, I would say 45, 45 and ten. That for Kilkenny Galway and Wexford. That's what it is. Hmm. I, truthfully speaking, I, I give Dublin very little chance. Sorry, me all lads. <laughs> but can, uh, I, can, I, can I go back to your question a minute ago? But uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's absolutely it's a bullshit rule in, in, in totality, right? After you're going to play, how many weeks next week will? Ah, <sighs> so it's going to get it's to eight. Ninth? It's going to get to eight weeks in a row because of the eight? fact the Kilkenny or so. sorry the Kildare game I should say is not scheduled yet for the week after. And I presumed when I got the fixtures from Leinster GA on Saturday, I'm guessing that Clare and Offaly are probably going to sit down together to work out whether they want that to be on the Sunday or the Saturday to maybe give an extra day's rest. But Keelan Kiley, who got banned the match today in Port Leash, was basically talking about this and he said they played consecutively five must-win games in back-to-back weeks now and they're facing into three weeks in a row before the slight break in the Joe McDonough. They've already picked up three season-ending injuries during that period. And he was mm-hmm. saying that like the workload on the players they're going to have to just deal with it and go and play next week but to even have a situation where you play in the league final that you have to win because of the promotion situation and then turn around in six days time to play against your biggest rivals in the Joe McDonough is a terrible workload on players this it's was not what the split season was meant to be about it's, 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 and probably if you're looking at what's the main reasoning behind the under 20s being I suppose sheltered from the senior it's born out isn't it I would think so, yeah, because yeah, these are also sports. guys who are going to be elite players with their either their school if they're eighteen or nineteen, or with the college team, probably. Yeah, so like college is over, schools are over. You're heading into the teeth now of both championships. Um, what's the difference like for a twenty-year-old versus a twenty-one-year-old? There's none. 
You know, if you're, if you're playing six weeks in a row, there's no difference. So there's no logic in whatsoever. That rule should be scrapped, to be honest. Like if the young fella, and I guarantee the young lad himself, and it happened go last year against Kenya, where two, the under twenties, two of our best players were used in the senior before we played Kenya in the under twenties, and you know potentially cost us. Do you know what I mean? Because they, they were that influential, if you like. So I think it's just a shit rule. Get rid of it. It's fine. The lads want to play themselves. Yeah. I just wonder as well whether 20s couldn't find a slot somewhere maybe a bit later on in the year. I'm not like, again, this is one of these things where we've got issues, but not necessarily solutions. But if it could be somewhere where it's not been, especially now there's group stages coming into these competitions, they're not straight knockout. Mm-hmm. And then the football even is on at the moment and you've got first round of the championships next week. There's just so much overlapping games at the moment. It's very mm-hmm. difficult on on players so i do feel for them um Bo Lawler uh, also dm me and the reason he dm me is because he said uh, this question is far too long for an instagram box he said i know the lads played with some of the best at the dark arts but you can take this first murph is the role of the bastard and he says in the nicest possible way gone now given media and social media scrutiny so i suppose the point would be that if there was someone who was uh particularly clever in his bastardry chances are he'd be ripped <laughs> apart online and especially with the videos because <clears throat> even on the live video last week there was a back and forth going on between two or three people in the youtube and they mm. were talking about you highlighted this online and what other guy who put a clip up last week so it was like tynan versus o'donoghue and one was trying to get one band and the other one was like well if you're going to get willow Ban- Will o'donoghue banned i'm going to get alan tynan banned and this kind of thing goes on so mm. i presume like if you're going to be caught with the multiple camera angles and everything right now it's yeah. probably difficult to be a bastard of the dark arts um but yeah the question would be is it still possible for someone like that, given the way things have changed? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's at a very diluted level. Like if you go back and think about some of the players, not that I would have never have called them bastards, but uh, <laughs> I would. <laughs> well, maybe if they're playing against me. But uh, there's lots of things that play into this. Like for example, there's lots of tackles now that aren't acceptable now that were acceptable 20 years ago. And if you saw it now it'd be on the RT news. Like, and the case in point, if the referee threw in a ball and that player and Tipperary pulling that happened with Colin Lynch and the boys, yeah. like there'd be news talk tomorrow morning. Pat Kenny would be, he'd be talking about it. Do you know what I mean? Whereas I think it's one of the greatest. I love it. Like, I remember when I used to see that and you'd be pumped as a young fellow watching that and tell you Colin Lynch. As soon as you've seen Colin Lynch and Ali Baker and these boys going in and said, this is going to be carnage. Nobody wearing a helmet. Nobody got split, but... So you, you bring that forward now. Imagine a referee threw the ball there tomorrow. Limerick are playing Clare, for example. And Willow who starts pulling like that. Lads will want him locked up. So what's acceptable now compared to back then is different again. And I would agree with you. Retrospective bans. Sure, Jesus, retrospective bans now compared to... They didn't exist, what, 15 years ago? And slowly through the years, different rules have been brought in. Like I remember Brian had often come into us there was a different one every year. Third man in. If you come in and you shoulder a fella from behind, the two lads are around, and I come in and shoulder skeleton from behind, I'm gone. So, right, so yeah. yeah, so that's where the bastard would come in before. Like, he'd come flying in behind yeah, you. You better here. go. You better go, because if I turn around, <laughs> I might get you. But... <laughs> but, like, do you know these sort of things? Uh, so, I think, yeah, I do know what they're saying. The lads who are part of the dark arts, like, the dark arts now would be very much pulling at a lad's jersey. Um, like you saw Mikey Breen there and Stephen Bennett there a few weeks ago and he kind of stepping on his ankles and stuff. But like you can't throw a butter to hurl now. Like that'll be, you'll be banned for games if you do that. So it's very hard, <laughs> to quote tonight, it's very hard to be a bastard in the modern game. <laughs> Ask Gail about it there, you know. <laughs> Go on, Scal. Talk about bastardry. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about bastardry. Yeah, you actually, uh, uh, actually speaking of it, because I know I saw that question. You sent it in earlier. Ear Latanian was mentioned as one. That's not to say, like, I mean, that's not me quoting. That's Bo Lawler. <laughs> Scale took a yellow card for Ear Latanian against us one, a few years ago. Lawler in a final 2012. Tanyan struck Richie Power with the hurl. <laughs> and you got booked. I remember that. Do you remember you got booked? Red helmets. No, I went over. You were wearing yeah. a white jersey. He was wearing a maroon. Were you in yeah, a maroon scale? Is this what happened? What happened was... Um, Power scored a goal himself. And Larkin, Larkin Canyon. came through. Larkin was coming through and he took a shot. <laughs> and yeah, and then it's, it's, and I saved it. And, and Power got the rebound. Is that right? Power got the rebound, yeah. And Tanyan, himself and Tanyan jostled and Tanyan hit him with the hurl. Yeah. But, and you uh, got but I don't think he got him very good. But then Power went down and I, I, I went over just to help him up. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> the ref didn't like the way I helped him up. So like, I don't know. Yeah. Now, did, did you help him upscale while maybe having some choice words while you were picking him up, or how did you help him up? Well, I didn't tickle him like. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the fuck up was like. <laughs> yeah. Now, what actually I will go back to as well, and not to be telling all the story, but what I will go back to is uh, there was a great one. My first All Ireland final, 2011. Uh, Noel Hickey and Owen Kelly were on each other and I remember the first few minutes and I was kind of very much I felt nearly like a tourist because I was looking around at like Tommy and Jackie and JJ like the lads I'd watched from Hill 16 but now we were in the middle of them but I remember Brendan Cummins was poking a ball out down on top of us and I was with John O'Brien and we were kind of in position he wouldn't he wasn't going to get involved in a, a ball that was about to land but I could hear shouting and yelping coming from behind us the next thing I looked Owen Kelly was sprinting for the ball and Noel Hickey was just lashing him with the hurl, like just flicking him in the in the arse, in the ribs. And, were, and Owen Kelly was swinging back at Noel Hickey. And the two boys were just lashing each other the whole way out and calling each other dis- different things, like, you know, whatever you want to call it. But that was kind of dark arse that I'd say if you saw it now, like, you know. I love that. that. But now all in good spirit. Yeah. Like the two boys were just tough as nails. Like no one, like Noel Hickey, infamously so tough. Owen Kelly was a it was a phenomenally tough player as well, you know, really hardy and would take that, like you know. But uh, I always remember that one, just laughing at it, going, "Geez, that's brilliant! I love that." Middle of an Ireland final, like middle of an Ireland final, two boys baiting each other like asses going around the place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to forget about your Sunday game 15s, but before that, call Max 79, Limerick supporter again, regular question maker on Instagram. So your question's definitely getting in. Who is better, DJ Kerry or Shefflin? Paul, you have to pick one. Smiley face. So, Paul, you yeah. can go first. DJ or Shefflin? Yeah, I'm going to go with Henry. I just, if I, if I have to pick one. So, the context of that was growing up, like, for every young fella in Kilkenny, it was DJ. Like, DJ was, and you couldn't move for the Black Coopers around Kilkenny. But then once I was around teenager, the reason I wear a green helmet is because of Henry. Like, when I was, could, could pick a colour of a helmet, my first helmet I could pick when I was about 12, up to then they were bought for me, and you had a yellow helmet, you had a whatever colour helmet. But uh, no, it was Henry. And even playing with him then, just seeing what he does and what he did and uh, very f- weaknesses. Could you pick weaknesses in his game? I don't think you could. Very hard to pick him in DJ as well. But look, at, yeah, I mean, what? 10 All-Irelands, 11 All-Stars. Hard to argue with Henry. Yeah. Get your notebooks ready because we'll get to that in a second. But Patrick Coleman on the YouTube said, Will, best luck to your Offaly team. It would be great to see them back at the top table, but I'm still hoping that Kildare can get up. I'm going to be deadly honest. I put a message into the WhatsApp group earlier on today, about nine minutes into the game. And I said, looks like Kildare going up. And then I had to go and do a quick check. The Kildare hadn't played in Division 1 since the 1970s. It was all set for the story of that later on today. And then Offaly, remarkably, turned it around. Didn't go ahead until, I think it was 52 minutes into the game. Uh, They were 1-4 to a point down after nine minutes. If you're watching this on the Sunday game after the podcast today, have a look at Jerry Keegan's goal, which put them ahead. The game was on YouTube as well, so it should be uh, doing the rounds. Cracking goal. And you're just thinking, this Kildare team have got a physicality about them. They were creating chances. They were wrestling some frees at that point as well. James Burke was putting the frees over. And you're thinking, this is only going one way at that point in the game. And then Offaly managed to get a handle on Kildare as the first half went on. Again, this is a familiar story. I remember talking to you guys last week and saying, Kerry hit too many wides in the first half and it came back to haunt them. Similarly, Kildare had 11 wides in the entire game. They had eight of those wides in the first half, a lot of them from good scoring chances when they were on a roll. And then Offaly just started to slowly but surely get a grip in the game. It was 1-11 to 11 points at half time. made a few changes. Shane Dooley had a really good goal chance for Offaly before half time. Uh, tried to maybe be a little bit too clever. Uh, he had gone round Paddy McKenna, the Kildare goalkeeper, and it looked like he was just going to shorten his grip, hit it low. He tried to flick it back over him again, and it ended up going over the crossbar as opposed to under. And then Offaly just in the second half, Charlie Mitchell, who I mentioned, the under-20 captain came on, was a really good focal point in their attack for the second half. When Offaly got in front, with about 18, 90 minutes to go, it didn't look like they were going to be caught after that. And so it proved. Um, they only conceded um, a very small amount of chance in the second half. I thought Ben Keneally was excellent. Keelan Kiley got man the match was uh, particularly excellent in the second half. And yet Kildare kind of eked away a little bit at the end. And there was blasting operations with the last puck of the ball, which is Paddy McKenna, their goalkeeper, came up to try and score when there was a three-point differential. Offaly goalkeeper Stephen Corcoran uh, chased it down. It was a bit like the Nash penalty, you know, when guys were crazy enough to run out at a 21-yard free. He blocks the ball. And Stephen Corcoran then cleared... You were there, Skell, so you get an appreciation of how much pay, how much he got in this. It went over, you know, the apartments over on the far side from the dugouts. Yeah. Went over the apartment block, and I'm pretty sure it cleared the road as well. 
It was one of the longest pucks I've ever seen uh, from Stephen Corcoran, which brought the full-time whistle up. So after you're going back to Division 1, they've won Division 2A for the second time in three years. It's disappointing, Skell, for Kildare, because this was a golden opportunity, and particularly <coughs> with the start that they got. But I think there was enough in that Kildare performance today and what they did going unbeaten throughout the group stage to think that Kildare can go well in the McDonough Cup. And I think they're going to go well in 2A again next season as well. Yeah, like you mentioned eight wides in the first half. Yeah. And like if they, if they convert half those, what they'll do now is they'll go back and they'll, they'll, they'll obviously rule the chances they missed and the what ifs, etc. And they'll focus on the wides and they'll look at that. But <clears throat> ultimately they've had a, it's a good season to date. Do you know what I mean? Uh, in, I think if David Herity was honest, did he think with 100% belief he was going to qualify out up to Division 1? I don't, I don't know the man well enough to think, but I, I would find it maybe hard to say that with 100% he believed he would, especially with Offaly coming down. I so think like that'd be a dream season, scale if that Yeah, happened. I just, you know, I, I didn't know. Obviously, I'm not very, I'm not very close to that setup, but I, I didn't think, like, I would have given them, let's say, a 30 40% chance to get up. I thought Offaly were, admittedly, I thought they were guaranteed to go back up, you know, mm-hmm. with, the, with the numbers they have and the hurdles they have. And look, proven right <laughs> so <laughs> so off they go um, but look good season so far but like Kildare and we, we said it numerous times they've gained massive momentum but massive momentum and yes they look at it it's a loss and they'll have to accept it etc but ultimately they've, they've gained massive momentum into a very tough competition which now they know that they can actually win so the, the proof in the pudding now so they've gone through the league they've had some you know a relatively good, good campaign they'll say and they go into the championship and say right we can actually win this we can win this you know, so so every game is improvement. I know they look at today, they lost, but they'll take positives out of the game today. They'll take a number of elements and say, right, we have to work on those. And then in a couple of weeks' time, or a couple of weeks' time, say so soon they'll, they'll they'll have to improve. So I don't think all is lost to them, and they're giving a great show. Yeah, the other thing as well, as I mentioned already, they're in tier two in the minor, but they're handing out some beatings in there. I think they're going to be strong enough next year, particularly to go up to the uh, minor tier one championship uh, within Leinster as well. If we look at what Nace have done, if we look at them winning All-Ireland Intermediate, competing well in the Leinster Senior last year, I think there's a feeling at the moment, Murph, that those boats are coming up for Kildare currently. Even if today is a bit of a setback, there's no doubt that things are moving in one direction for Kildare right now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was, you know, an absolutely brilliant league for uh, for Kildare. And, and like you said, that game, if you know, other day those, those points go over and Kildare are, you know, home and hosed and out the gap. But, you know, even credit to Offaly there. Um, like, they closed out the game really well. Like it, it drifted there to two points at one stage, pushed it back out to three. And just, you know, they probably showed that small bit more experience um, closing out the game. Nevertheless, Kildare were still in with a shout. So, you know, I agree with Skettle there. I think they'll go away and they'll say, look, it, we, can't, we can't expect to go up when we hit eight wides. Uh, at a really important time of the game like even those wides if they're spread out a little bit more they disappear into the game but it probably fed a small bit of belief into Offaly that you know you could sense the tension I've been part of those games where you strike a good few wides in a row and the tension creeps in and it nearly invokes a purple patch out of the opposition team so you know the fact that Kildare had all those opportunities and Offaly only went in a goal down at half time I think Galway or Offaly would have went in and just said, listen, lads, you know, we're in after probably not of hurling to our, our potential at all here in the first half. One puck of the ball is in it. Let's go out here. And they had the momentum then really after that. But um, look, I mean, without doubt, brilliant league for Kildare. Absolutely brilliant. Probably would have, you know, again, maybe speaking out of turn, probably would have taken your hand off at the start of the year if this is what you told them they were going to be within the puck of the ball of getting promoted, you know. So they've 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 raised the bar for themselves now, and I think they'll only build on this. Um, and hurling is strong up there. So look, no, it's 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 of no consolation to them tonight. But I think again, it will benefit them going forward. I send over one of my takes from during the game too. David Nally right now is the best sideline taker in the country uh, since Joe Canning retired from Intercounty. I think it's four games in a row that he's put over sideline cuts. He put one over to win the game away from home against Kerry. Uh, scored one against Kildare in the last round, got one against Kerry the last day and scored one again today and it was picture perfect uh, the way he put it over. Tony Kelly fans will possibly come for me on this one, but David Nally is as good with sidelines as Tony Kelly is right now. Uh, John Kelly, the Offaly manager, said afterwards as well, it's insane to be playing seven games in seven weeks, but we'll fight to the last man. There won't be any excuse about the schedule. And during that time, they've also lost uh, three players to season-ending injuries. So let the debate continue uh, on the schedule around that. But Offaly are going back to Division 1. That brings us around very nicely, Skell, to Detox 101 last week, the Sunday game pundits team. 
I had given you guys a bit of a head start by giving you some of the player, some of the uh, pundits last week. So I have to go back to last week's show notes to actually find who I'd put in. But given that I'm sure this occupied the other half of your mind for the entire week, Scal, give us who you're putting in your Sunday game pundits best 15. Now, the terms and conditions here is they've done two or more episodes. Isn't that it? Yeah, I, yes. I think that's fair enough because yeah. otherwise right, we're in trouble. Somewhat, regu- somewhat regulars. Ever. I was looking at this, Murph, and the problem is that there's a lot of guys who you probably want to get in that were kind of in and off the panel or were in on a particular year or whatever yeah. else. If we stuck just to the main pundits, unfortunately, there is too many cornerbacks and too many forwards and perhaps mm. too many goalkeepers that have been picked in the last 10, 15 Hold years. On. You said too many cornerbacks and I have to admit before I came on, I didn't have a number two filled. Well, actually, I'll tell you, the beauty of this is that there's no consolidated list anywhere on the internet. No. Fellas. So a lot of it was like going into the back of your brain somewhere going, I'm fairly sure I saw that fella in a blazer somewhere on the Sunday game. Yeah, and I can yeah. picture just these terrible suits in the early 2000s. You yeah. know, like cream suits with blue ties and like I can just picture <laughs> Martin Story in one of those like so come with a pair of sunglasses. Poor old Martin Story if you got. No, yeah. you know, so right. I just put, anyway, I just put yeah, a few of them. So go on, go on. you open the floor and I'll tick them off against lads I picked last week as well. This was hard though because like you know as Murph said were they on it were they on it and then mm. to go and try and find a, book, find a book of evidence or trying to find some article or image it's impossible it's a good point anthem I saw <laughs> I, I did mine from memory and I actually misremembered a couple of players last week and had to take them out I was like because surely he did the Sunday game regularly and went oh wait you didn't. I'm interested to hear your one now Will because you're the encyclopedia here now and yeah, I, I, no, I, 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 Wikipedia you, was my source to double check it against and then I had to go from memory some of the others so okay. I think, I'll go on I think I'm going to finish a noble third out of three here today but anyways uh, <laughs> Brendan Cummins is in goals yeah uh, Mick Kevin is kind of like <laughs> did you rob him and me huh I just told you. I told you I didn't have a cornerback. Yeah, but just, before we came on, I said, I t- and we said, we can't change the team. And you just pung them in there. But I'm hardly going to put Dina Ella or a another in a way. Well, it would have been of the time. Go on, McAvenay. Right, go on. So I had to put him in like, thanks. Of course, but you didn't remember him. Part of the rules. You robbed him. You robbed him bastard. Go on. JJ Delaney, fullback. Bastards are hurling. That's what it is, right? JJ. And Jackie, yeah. uh, Jackie, other, the other fullback, other cornerbacks. That's three king lads. Look at one Well, Brian Whelan, Wing back. Pete Finnerty, centre back. Yep. Party Maher, the other wing. Uh, Brendan Maher, midfield with Martin Story. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's a tricky one now. Uh, Eddie Brennan, Henry, DJ. Eddie Keher, Joe, and John Milan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, You're not tempted well, to put Dalo in there. Not to preempt um, no. Alston. No. Who's he, who, who'd you take out? Brian Wheeler and Pete Finnerty, probably Maher. <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. See, that's yeah, it's a strong half back option. Isn't it, it is, yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, the half back lane is strong. Yeah, I'm quite content. Yeah, well, I have another fellow for the half back lane here. You didn't have, and it's not Dalo. So, what county is yeah. from? What county is not from? T- not too far from here now at all from Kenny Waterford. Waterford. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Moving on yeah. swiftly. Hi, <laughs> Jesus! You could have played him <laughs> centre back or centre forward. Only for the forwards are stacked. Go on, Murph. Where are you going? Cummins McCavna, yeah. who Scale didn't have in before going on air, but anyway, Prover. McCavna, JJ, Prover. Jackie, <laughs> <laughs> Brian Wheelahan, Ken McGrath, Paddy Maher. Ah, uh, Ken's great call. Ken McGrath. Uh, Brendan Maher and Anthony Daly. I know yeah. lads will be screaming going, Anthony Daly was really midfielder, but I just, I think he'd do no bother. He'd hurl away there midfield if you know Hassan. So they do DJ, Shefflin, Joe, Eddie, John Milan, Eddie Kerr. Honourable so mention there, the one, it was it was between Dignan and Daly for midfield. And Dignan did play midfield for Offaly. Uh, yeah. Never mind a wide variety of places, but he scored, was it 1-1 in about uh, 98, Leinster final for midfield? I think it was that, or 96 I, or 98. I think you could have had Dignan at wing forward or wing back as well if you wanted to. You could have had him anywhere, really. Yeah. yeah. Tomas McCarthy. See, I was going to put Tomas McKay in and then I was caught by the statue of limitations of D. Tux's original point where he said kind of over the last 15 years or so. Yeah. And over, tell me, I couldn't think with confidence, was Nicky English on it? Uh, he did I just, Sky. He, I can't remember he, where he did the Sunday he, game. He managed, well. he managed to career in 2001, the Ireland. Yeah. Why do I, he stepped down then kind of pretty soon after, didn't he? That year or the year after? Didn't mm-hmm. he go on, on RT after that? You could have, but like this is the beauty of it. Like, yeah, you know, oh, I can't think. You left to go to the RT archives and pay 150 euro to get the video footage because I don't remember <laughs> that. Yeah. 
The problem is that someone's going to point out someone really obvious that was on the panel in like the late 80s or 90s that we've forgotten about that would have filled Crazy, in a yeah. slot and we'll go, oh, fuck, why didn't I think of them? That yeah. was the problem, you see. I was trying to do this to the standard that Detox had given us, which was that they weren't just one-off occasions because there were times when, say, like a famous player ended up on the match coverage, say. Yeah. That's, I don't know, that's kind of wishy-washy. Like they need to be in the studio doing the Sunday game episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, look, I, I think look, lads, there's great names there. Ken McGrath is the one that I'd really forgotten about, and and he was on a lot as he well. Was yeah, do you know, don't be more full. Yeah, he was. I oh, don't you know about Skell missing balls in league finals. <laughs> he was <laughs> cutting the back off lads. That's what he was doing. <laughs> Ken yeah. McGrath, Jesus Christ, huh? How I can't believe I didn't have my own clubman Brian Whelan in, but then I didn't realise how much Whelan had done on the Sunday game so I kind of left him out initially and you so could I, put him in corner forward I had to remind and you he sco- and he scored one six for you yeah it was only when Skell <laughs> mentioned earlier on so I I had Daly as one wing back Potty Mara as the other and Pete Finnerty as six and then I put Joe Canning into midfield was my way of getting around the midfield problem oh, so yeah. Brendan Mara was an obvious choice in what? midfield yeah, I, I dropped Canning back, but the problem with this scale, and I looked at it, right, and I agonised a bit like you after I picked it last week. The problem is that when you put Canning back into midfield, it lacks a little bit of balance. It's like, you know, when lads pick a, a world 11 and they go, mm. do you know what, I'll put Leo Messi centre midfield just to make sure I can get all the other forwards into the team as well. Yeah. You're kind of lying to yourself to a certain extent. You're like, this team <laughs> yeah. wouldn't work. Because Paul yeah. Brennan Mara would have to do all the running because not that Canning <laughs> can't play further out the field, but basically you'd have six or seven scoring forwards in front of him. And lads yeah. running around there is what would happen. Mm. Yeah, I just look at your logic is completely flawed there, Will, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have accepted the limits of my logic here. And I'm you're, you're talking I'm about one of the greatest fame of all time. I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've never seen Skell argue as to why you shouldn't have a Galway fill in the team. That's just what I'm <laughs> gobsmacked with. It's the first time you've ever argued against a Galway person being in a team. Uh no. I'm he's in the team. He's in the team. I'm just thinking his positioning is questionable. Why don't you put him full back altogether? Just to have him in the team. Oh, I'm sorry, Skell. I'm sorry that like Henry Shefflin, <laughs> DJ Carey, um, Eddie Kerr <laughs> are available to go in here. John Milan could probably do a job. Put DJ midfield in. Put DJ midfield. DJ DJ never played midfield. Like Joe drifted out that Joe. way a bit. Oh my god. Oh my god. DJ, gosh. I remember DJ in around two thousand and five, I think it was, hurled centre back for Kenny up in Port Leash. For Grant, let's put DJ Carey in midfield then, Skell. I'm just saying he did because I remember looking at him going, This is unbelievable. DJ centre back. <laughs> I can imagine I... you picking your jaw off the floor, Murph. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this the argument, though? This is what he said about Limerick. Some of these guys could well have adapted if we gave them a chance to play further out the field. Yeah. Uh, but forward never survive in the back, though. That's the thing. No, probably. They're all too, they're all too precious. No spirit. Except Tommy, Tommy, except Tommy. No, no spirit. spirit. No, no spirit. spirit. <laughs> By all means, completely flamous within the comments or within yeah. the messages for next week about the players we've picked. But I, I think the challenge is, and Murph set this out nicely, you have to find someone who is a regular on the Sunday game. And they didn't necessarily, when they were picking people to go on TV, went, do you know what, actually, we need another cornerback. We need another fullback to come on. Mm. We've ended up with a lot of forwards. That's yeah. the first yeah. announcement of the pool. And the thing is, like, I, I text Richie Hogan before this because I remember he did, like, did the Sunday game do this thing of if a player gets injured maybe mid-season or yeah. whatever to bring him on? Like, Lee Chin has been on it. And there's been a few lads on it. So you just get, get rid of those players because there could be plenty of lads there, like Austin Gleeson and these lads that you could be tempted to throw in. But it's a kind of a three or more episodes. Do you know what, Skell? Screw you. Lee Chin's been on more than two episodes. Lee Chin can go into my midfield and that frees up Kenny to go into my half forward line. So now. Who's dropping out so your forwards? I don't know. Uh, I haven't got quite that far. <laughs> so you have seven forwards. <laughs> well, look, I can drop one of them. I... You actually used the term statue of imitations there a while ago. And now you're at, you have 16 players on the pitch. Like, who are you? Kill him a good. I'm sorry, right? Let Canning oh, go morph. slightly further forward. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, sure, look at Jesus Christ. Shots fired. Shots fired. Oh, fired. Elephant in the room, is <laughs> because uh, you know I have gone on to my next question Eddie Brennan impacts up go on so I have gone on to my next question because you mentioned Tommy there I've gone to my top five I'm calling them hybrids of oh, all time geez. what is this what with is the, with the blade. To? top the, five players with a in their name like you're just no, going to pull this is top five hybrids <laughs> guys who played guys who played in the forwards and the backs and were oh. equally as impressive that's a good question. Is this the point where I bring up that I hurled centre forward for Kenny against Antrim and Case and Park and scored three points? I think if oh, I feel well, it is. What, under 14? No, no, senior. You did not. How did you end up a centre forward? Brian, Brian put me in centre forward. I played when I, in 2009, uh, I, I was brought on in the Welsh Cup uh, for Kenny midfield. Um, and scored two points against Dublin in, in Parnell Park. And the following week, we went up. I think it was the following week. We went up and we played Antrim in Case and Park. 
and I was a sub. And about two minutes, three minutes in the second half, I was thrown on centre forward and I was just running around striking balls and just three balls popped up, three balls over the bar. And that was it. So you were in the right place at the right time. Right it. place at the right time. How and did you never play centre forward again? That's the question. How did that not happen? Um, because I was uh, playing Maybe more. because Henry Shefton was there? I don't know. Maybe. He, he, yeah, he just, there's a young fella called Henry Shefton who was, uh, <laughs> at that stage, had about seven all hurlers <laughs> and two hurlers sure. in a year. So I just, you know, no, I, play, I played midfield for quite a bit after that. Uh, so that was kind of. So they kept firing you back and back and back and before that. Only were... slowly. Before <laughs> yeah. I knew it, I'd be in the goal with the useless lads. <laughs> I can I can feel a tweet from Owen Murphy already at this point uh, no, uh, yeah, for that joke. Yeah, yeah. So go on, yeah. Skell. Have you picked out hybrid players or is this a to be continued kind of thing where you've went hybrid players? I have four. I don't have the fifth. Right. So, so Kyle what's Hayes, hybrid player? Hayes hybrid player is a player that can go between. The no, the, the guy who was like not who playing, but the guy who was equally effective in the forwards they were at the backs. So right, I'm, I'm going to preempt three of your players right now, will I? Go ahead. Tommy Brian Hill and Ken Ken McGrath. Yeah. Okay. And so you've, you're picking five, is it? Oh, yeah. And I have a fourth there. Ollie Canning is the fourth. Did Ollie Canning? Was he was he forward? Come on now. Test for early knowledge, yes. Ollie Canning for Port Town now, is he? Do you remember he hit the crossbar against Clare? She, that's tenuous enough now to be thrown into a hybrid. He hit the crossbar against Clare. Oh, he, we, we're, over, we're over the line. Jesus Christ. Eh? We're over <laughs> the line. I think John Conlon may well be standing back going, you know what, I often been bad in two positions here. I feel, and hard, I feel hard done by here at the moment. But, but I tell you, he was... Like Perry Nash, as, yeah. as, like Richie English, these lads who have played fully Declan in the Hannan. Matt Lads hitting the crossbar in 99. See... <laughs> If you were just and winning four all stars at left corner back. If you would just sort him out for one second and give me a chance, right? He started in the forwards for Galway. Yeah. That's where he was a forward for Galway in the late nineties and that's where he started. And then in 01 he went back into cornerback. I'd have to even throw Brendan Rogers in here ahead of that, like, because I mean, there's a man who plays full back or full forward in two different sports, like but who the fuck is Brendan Rogers? Hurler and footballer. Hurler and footballer. Full, Neal, is it? full forward and full back. Yeah. Shock Neil. Yeah. There's a man now. Right, not hitting crossbars. He's not going on my list. Yeah, Liam Rush, there's another one for you. Can, can I put in John Troy for something slightly different where he started off in goals and then became an elite forward? Yeah, I have Eugene Clune as well there. Yeah, it's a good call. And, and Kevin Broderick and two other lads. And Alan Collins would be played in goals in a minor final and never touched the ball once from Puck Outs or Anton. Never touched the I never trust the ball. Well, I think there was a guy he could have bring Corcoran, lads. Come on, Jesus, how did we mention? He could Corcoran. have been Hoburn. He poked out the ball. There's lads from Cork have already put comments below <laughs> because we hadn't said them early enough. That's not that's not a bad question. Lads. I, I'm happy. With that's that. a good question. I'll give you that. Yeah. You've actually you're the worst person to answer it though, but it, it's a good question. Put me on the spot, yeah. Put myself on the spot. Actually, what am I saying? John, I, Troy, lo- I love how you've kind of created this like out of nowhere. We're like, oh, we'll get us on the game 15. Now we have to have a hybrid five. Um, <laughs> we have a hybrid five. And just to, just to highlight as well why, why Nathan or Tommy often ask, how do you keep doing two hours every week? It's because... These yeah, we're on, we're on two questions. hours now again. <laughs> no, we're not, we're not quite at two hours, but this is what no. classically happens, right? Because I get messages which are going for the pod tomorrow. Uh, so Hurler on the Ditch, who people probably know quite well from Twitter, right? So Hurler on the Ditch is... Uh, a very prominent tweeter about hurling and he's also got a website where he um, sticks up plenty of comments. This is maybe just food for thought because we talked about Limerick quite glowing earlier and we have talked about hand passes a little bit as well. Um, his article this week starts with the general narrative peddled out by the media following Tipperary's 128-25 to loss to Limerick was a positive one. This is a good game, a great game, rip-roaring contest was a quote attributed to a high-profile analyst. The truth is, it was the best of a very bad lot and our standards as hurling spectators have fallen off a cliff. It's totally different to the narrative that maybe was going around. He says, then again, some like this hybrid mishmash of Olympic handball and lacrosse. Some people enjoy the following aspects of modern hurling. Uh, a game played with zero goal threat and a shot from the middle third every minute. A game where players take unlimited steps whilst breaking the tackle. A game where there's constant use of illegal spare hand tackles. Where throwing the ball up the field is a skill. A foul that occurred nearly 50 times in that game last Saturday. Where Aaron Galan gets his first possession after 46 minutes as Limerick refused to hit the ball in. The hurler on the ditch, he says, will continue to watch the sport. But the reality is, like many supporters, it's not worth travelling and spending money or time to regularly watch a filtered version version of what was once without question the greatest sport of them all Skell what do you think of that it's a very different take to you now last week that's a bit cutthroat isn't it 
It is, but that's very much uh, yeah. an article which is, you know, uh, to be fair, right, that's going to spark a bit of debate. No, I, I don't mind it at all. Like, I think debate is healthy because I think debate <clears throat> brings solutions if, you want, if you've got issues. Uh, but it goes back to the earlier point I said a while ago with regard to how I view the game or how I see the game. Now, I know that he might laugh. Sometimes it's over-analytical. You know, it's probably too deep in the final details and just I don't exactly probably accept the, the grand game as it is, you know. Scale, if people are coming to find a hurling podcast where we regularly go an hour and 20 minutes talking about hurling, particularly when, you know, we're previewing for the best part one game next week, they're not going to mind if it goes in a bit too deep. Yeah, too deep. Right, let's go. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I know, I hear what he's saying because I suppose he's probably thinking with an element of romance to games previously that he's watched, you know, if you're in recent seasons in, in years gone by whereby it's just been rip roaring games like 100 mile an hour stuff and like the thing is you don't have to go back too far ago as we had them last year you know and we're going to have them this year again the championship the championship is a different animal entirely to the league we, we can attest that completely the league is is, uh, is a competition whereby you don't play your best teams you don't show your full hand teams aren't fully fit you know there's, there's still preparation going on etc etc we've covered all this over the last 8 weeks championship is where it's at if at the end of the championship we have similar situations whereby we've large gaps in scoring and then kind of medium intensity games then I'll say something but right now I'm, I'm quite content where the game is at and, and looking forward to the championship Murph? Um, yeah again I t- touch back to the rose tinted glasses I think we have this idea that the game uh, 15 years ago 20 years ago that every game was brilliant because we only remember the good ones at this stage but there was poor games back then which could much you know there, um, we have a lot more games now so invariably by having a lot more games you have a few good ones, you'll have a good few bad ones. So I, no, I disagree with it. Like, I mean, again, I agree with Skehel and I, I like hearing someone coming forward with their own opinion as to why they think the game isn't where it should be and so on and debate is healthy. But no, I stick by what I would have said earlier. Um, I think the game is at an incredible, incredible level. And again, it's all how you view the game. If you want you know, those old games of long high balls going down and lads going up competing for them and all this. I can appreciate why you want that. And, you know, hurls being broke and different things. But those things are still happening, but maybe just as infrequently as they used to. But nevertheless, go back and watch some of those old games as well. Yeah, they, they are great games. But there's also, like, you know, periods there where they're not as great or as, as let's say, condensed with really high-level skill as as we think, you know, and that's not to slight any games, but mm. go back and look at some of them games and they're excellent, but there's also periods where you can say that there's a lot of really high level skill at times in the game. And it's just our memory. Our memory of these games sometimes leads us to believe that, you know, 20 years ago was a better time. And it wasn't, there wasn't as many, there wasn't as many teams back 20 years ago competing as there are now. In interest of fairness, right, this is probably going to end up in a bonus episode on Wednesday just because of how long we've gone. I think uh, I'll flick the article onto both of you so we can both mm-hmm. have a read of it because there's a, there's a good few more paragraphs kind of breaking down his feeling on where the game was at last week. And that's someone who's obviously gone off taking four or five days to have a think and to break down the game. Let's have a read of it and we could probably yeah. chat about it next week. I think they're the main points in the first three, four paragraphs I've just given to you there. So yeah, we'll have a look at the article. We'll look at it properly for next week because we haven't had a chance because we recorded a bit early uh, this week. Uh, so the main pod available right now uh, keep the ear out for the bonus pod, which will be available Wednesday in the Hurling Pod <coughs> feed. Uh, you've just got the full thing on video if you're watching us on YouTube currently. If you're watching YouTube, uh, give the video a like, uh, maybe stick some comments uh, down in the comment section. It all helps the glorious YouTube algorithm to push things up along the way. And lads, we'll be back next week to chat about the Division 1 final between Kilkenny and Limerick. Chat to you then. Sound lads. Good luck. OTB's The Hurling Pod. With Board Gosh Energy. Proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship.